You know I've traveled near and far To see the shining sea I've seen a lot of places And people that were nice to me One place that's in my heart And this is how I feel I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville She's nestled in the sand hills on a river called Cake Field. Special to so many who proudly served our country here. She was named for Lafayette and known for cotton mills. I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville. My hometown, Fayetteville I'm so proud to be from here It don't take long when you're away from home To find out how you feel It's always good to come home to Fayetteville Babe Ruth hit his first one Heard around the world Sherman marched with the Union And burned the arsenal Old Market House still standing But stands for freedom's will I'm talking about my hometown, Fayetteville Take long when you're away from home To find out how you feel It's always good to come home to Fayetteville My all-American city, Fayetteville Talking about my hometown Fayetteville Good evening. We'd like to call the October 27th, 2014 Fayetteville City Council meeting to order and uh, ask Pastor Terry Alston with the Abundant Faith Fellowship Church to come forward, please. Lead us for the invocation. If everyone would please stand and remain standing through the Pledge of Allegiance, please. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, our Father and our God, Lord, here we are at this city council meeting. Father, we invoke your divine presence in this meeting. And Father, we ask you to forgive us of all of our short sins and our shortcomings and our broken vows. Father, as we gather in this place and convene in this meeting, we ask you to speak to these, our local lawmakers. Bless them, God, with sound wisdom and understanding that the decisions that they make, God, will be those that will benefit every citizen of this community. We thank you for those that's here now. Bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. 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 Of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation and to God and the with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Pastor Alston. Uh, council, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Councilmember Wright. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve the agenda um, with the exceptions 
of 806. Let me make sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. With 8011 and 8014 and 8015. That will, we will pull for further discussion until next month. Okay, Councilmember Wright, Councilmember Colvin with a second. Any discussion on the uh, uh, motion, Council? All right, seeing none, I'll ask for your vote, please. Got a question? Oh, Mr. Moan. Since those three items are on the consent agenda, I believe right now we're just approving the overall agenda, and then we would pull those when we get to consent. Procedurally, I think that's how it's supposed to go. That's correct. You could approve the agenda and then do the consent agenda separately to pull them off consent. Okay. So, would you like to amend? Uh, yes, I'll amend. I'd like to amend that motion until we approve the agenda. Okay, great. All right. Mr. Colvin? Right. Any further discussion? All right, Council. Please vote. Madam Clerk, that's unanimous. Uh, in the audience, we do have a couple special guests. Would like to um, recognize former state representative and former Mayor Bill Hurley, who joins us this evening. He'll be uh, up in just a few minutes to speak. Also, former uh, City Council woman Mabel Smith is in the audience. Welcome, welcome home. And uh, also, former County Commissioner Johnny Evans is with us. So, uh, pleasure to see you all in the audience. Uh, also in the audience is uh, North Carolina State Representative Rick Glazier. Mr. Glazier, if you could come forward, please. And our uh, Fayetteville Police Department, uh, Officer Sanders. You, oh, come on. Come on up. Sure. Join Mr. Glazier. <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Welcome. Uh, if it, it pleased the, uh, the city council. It is really my honor to be here this evening and to make a presentation, a presentation that came about with the help of the mayor's office and with the chief's office. Um, there was an article that appeared in the newspaper several months ago detailing um, Officer Saunders' incredible work uh, with the homeless population of this city. For those who don't know, she served in the military and served this country for eight years has been on the police force, I uh, believe, for 13 years and uh, 10 years as its homeless officer. I had the opportunity to see her this um, spring and early summer in a trip at Operation In As Much um, uh, and saw her respond immediately to a domestic violence call that um, Sue Bird gave her and saw her interact um, with people um, in the most compassionate and, um, and um, dignified and professional manner. And if you read that article this summer about the work that she has done with the homeless population of Fayetteville, approaching everyone in a tough way but with compassion, with humor, and with dignity, treating them with respect, going far above the call of duty, whether it's giving blankets to the homeless on an embankment, or water, or food, or giving them advice on which shelter they should be in. Um, this is what policing is all about and, and really ought to have the highest recognition. It is therefore my honor on behalf, I hope, of the mayor and city council and all of the state legislative delegation, um, Officer Sanders, to award you the second highest award given to any civilian in the state of North Carolina, the Old North State Award, which says it all in its beginning, which says for dedication and service beyond expectation and excellence to the great state of North Carolina and on behalf of the citizens of this state. It is now my honor by the power vested in me by the governor of the state of North Carolina, Pat McCrory, to award you as the newest recipient of North Carolina's Old North State Award for service truly above and beyond the call to all of the most vulnerable citizens of this town. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Glazier. Thank you most of all, Officer Sanders, for everything you do every day. You are everywhere. At this time, uh, 
Councilmember Wright, if you would come to the podium and uh, like to call Roderick Baker, who is the chairman of the Homeless and Hunger Stand Down Committee, to join Councilmember Wright. We appreciate the work you do for the uh, outstanding service you do for the unfortunate, uh, less fortunate in the community. And, um, Mr. Council Mayor, uh, excuse me, it, it, would it be okay if those representatives for, for that committee would come and stand as you call their name? Absolutely. As Councilmember Arp calls your name, please come forward as well. A certificate of recognition is presented to Janelle Lewis for her outstanding and dedicated service to those less fortunate in our community through her commitment to the homeless and hungry st hunger stand down. This 27th day of October 2014 signed Nat Robertson, Mayor, City of Fayetteville. And I'm just going to, if it's okay yes, for yes. brevity, I'm just going to read the names of the other ones who will be receiving the same certificate. Miss Mary John Williams. Mr. Wesley Fountain, Ms. Carla Fagan. Please come forward as your name is called. Mr. Don Bennett, Jr. Ms. Dolores Taylor. Mr. Roderick E. Baker. Ms. Crystal Moore McNair. Mr. Sylvester Harrison, Mr. L. Ron Pringle, Ms. Grace Pemberton, Ms. Julia Morales, Ms. Cynthia Shepard, Miss Mary Webster. You got to come on Captain Jason Smith. Miss Taylor Morgan. Miss Pamela Story. Mr. Steve Rogers. Mr. Roderick Ford. Miss Peggy Middleton, Miss Melody Clark, Miss Janice Voter, and Mr. Eval McIntyre. I stand correct. I'm sorry. It's Miss Eval McIntyre. My apologies. Mr. Baker, while you're at the podium, uh, tell us something about your organization. Well, let, me, let, me, let me speak first. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I just wanted to say how proud I am of this uh, group. Uh, I served as a chair of this organization for three years prior to me being elected as city council. And so I know firsthand the hard work that uh, it takes to put on an organization and put on uh, an event such as this one. And I just wanted to commend you for a job well done and uh, Minister Reddick for taking over and doing a great job as the chair um, of this organization. So let's give them a round of applause. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Wright, and the members of the Fayetteville, Cumberland County, it is my honor to accept these recognitions on behalf of the community, Homeless and Hunger Stand Down. We definitely appreciate you. And the 2014 Stand Down will be held on Friday, November the 14th, from 9 o'clock a.m. until 2 o'clock p.m. at the VFW Post 6018 at 116 Chance Street. And what we do at our event, we offer a one-stop location for homeless veterans, individuals, and families are those that are at risk of being homeless. And what we do in this event, we provide public, uh, we have public and private agencies and volunteers and sponsors that assist in getting prescription, flu shots, free haircuts, free lunches, and job placement assistance, health and dental screenings, housing assistance, education assistance, 
veteran assistance, blood pressure screening, and much more. And for more information, you may contact me at my personal number at area code 910-728-5614 or Crystal Moore McNair at 910-483-1179. Once again, it is my honor and thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for what you do, Mr. Baker. Ms. Jensen, if you'd go down to the podium, please. And I'd like to call Ms. Jennifer, is it Las Cleet? Up to the podium as well, please. <clears throat> Miss Las Cleet. Oh, there she is. You were in the overflow room, weren't you? I am the perfect person to be presenting tonight. <laughs> she walks in. <laughs> Running late. Mayor Pro Tem Davy. Hello. There's quite a few recipients that we're going to name. Are they in the overflow room as well? Or? No, I'm not sure. I've only seen maybe one. And okay. Maybe one actually made it here tonight, unfortunately. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Um, at this time, I will read the Certificate of Recognition. This is for a civic excellence and dedication to making City of Fayetteville a better place for the future generations. The Certificate of Recognition says, on behalf of the members of City Council and more than 208,000 residents, we hereby present the Certificate of Recognition for your civic excellence and dedication to making this city a better place. At this time, I'd like to call the recipients. Adam Hecamp, C. Khan, Kwashana McDougal, Elisa Moore, Macy Nash, Elena Peters, Harrison Ray, Molly Rose, Jane Schaefer, Nadia Schultz, Jennifer Stevenson, Deshani Suggs, Grace Truel, Justin Wadsworth, Stuart Williams, Anthony Wren, Elisa Faith Allen, Grant Bennett, Allison Boone, Rebecca Bullard, Wallace Cameron, Shatina Carr, Cedric Craig, George Crawley, Allison Elroyd. Oh, we've got somebody. Yay. Let me read your name again. George Crawley. Thank you so much for being here. Do I need to get up, George? <laughs> Allison Elroyd, Emily Fox, Amanda Goldberg, and Malia Haney. So since we have George and Jennifer, I don't know if y'all want to take a moment to just explain about your civic excellence. Oh, okay. About your experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had the opportunity, uh, me and everyone else in the group, but they're not here. So um, we came and um, talked with uh, Mayor Robertson and learned a lot about what it takes to run the city. And... um. We even got the chance to uh, uh, run a, a mock meeting, like, um, how y'all are doing today? And, um, <laughs> oh, I mean, no, this is not a mock meeting. What we did was a mock meeting. I apologize. 
and um, I had a good time, and I learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you, George. Good job. Council, at this time, we'll move to... Mr. Uh, Mayor, I have an announcement, please. Oh, uh, Mr. Crisp, there's thank a, you. There's a song that starts out, Do you like good music? Yeah. And, Fevel, if you do, listen to this. Because the armed forces command the Army's ground forces band. It's going to be hosted by our own Fevel State University and the J.W. Seabrook Auditorium on Sunday, November 9th, at 3 p.m., the price of admission is to show up. But you better get there early because I can almost assure you it's going to be a packed house. Again, the Army Ground Forces Band will do a salute to veterans celebrating America's heroes. Sunday, November 9th, at 3 p.m., in the JWC Book Auditorium, sponsored by the Federal State University, our own university. Be there. You old veterans that love the sound of the drums, come on out and like good music. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crisp. I apologize for missing you on the, uh, on the printed agenda. Uh, at this time, we'll go to the public forum, which is item 6.0. Uh, this is a time that any Fayetteville resident may have input and a voice in what goes on in the city. However, due to policy restrictions, the forum will not last any longer than 30 minutes. Each speaker will be limited up to three minutes to address the city council on issues related to the city only. Individuals wishing to speak at tonight's public forum should have signed up with the city clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. If you're here to speak on items that may appear on the agenda later, we ask that you reserve your comments until uh, that uh, item comes up. So when you hear your name called by the city clerk, we ask that you come to the podium, clearly state your name and home address. Then when you see the lights located on the podium change from green to yellow, you have 30 seconds left to speak. When you see them change to red, your time has expired. And again, due to our policy restrictions, we are not able to extend the time given. There are more than 10 people signed up at three minutes each. That's 30 minutes. Your time will expire. So we ask that if you don't have three minutes worth that you don't take your three minutes, be courteous enough to pass that time on. So with that being said, Madam Clerk, please call the first speaker. Yes, sir. Our first speaker is Mr. Lawrence Frawley. Go right ahead, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lawrence Frawley. We live on Rock Spring Road in Montclair. I'm here to ask for your help with the streets in Montclair. Many of the streets in Montclair sink above the lateral and main lines, which, by the way, these are less than 20 years old. I'm informed by PwC that the problem is the soil above the lines was not properly tamped during the initial installation of these lines. But I'm also aware that the lines under Glensford Drive required additional repair. Some clamps and such had to be replaced related to the initial installation. Other work was required to extend the laterals. This caused approximately a six month delay to be issued. I think there's a combination of faults in the other lines that all originate from the initial installation. I would like fault to be determined and any and all action to recoup costs be done as soon as possible. I do not want the taxpayers, the ratepayers, to shoulder all the expense every time. The current patching of the roads is poor at best and not effective at all, since the road continues to sink, some places as much as four inches in a month. We are left with roads that are sometimes so rough as to be dangerous. I got two more things. I'll try and get them done real quick. During the past two neighborhood meetings, 
With the contractor, PwC, and DOT, I requested that the section of Glensford Drive that runs past two schools be finished and completely open as soon as possible. The need is to get the orange and white barrels out of the way and make safety for the children. Drivers have a habit when there's orange or white barrels around to only see the orange or white barrels. We got a lot of little kids in that neighborhood and I don't want to see one of them hurt because of this. Last but not least, the Greenway Strip that is intended to go down the middle of Glensford Drive. Before that goes in, it gets all landscaped. Please have some contract in place to take care of it or don't do it. Pave it over. I don't want it looking like the stretch closer to the mall, which is all overgrown most of the time and looks crappy. This is a neighborhood. This is not a business district. Either do it right or don't do it. Thank you. If you've got any questions, I can give you some more specific information if it's necessary. Thank you, Mr. Farley. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. J. Hatch. Mr. J. Hatch. Not present. Our next speaker is Mr. Hunter Evans. Mr. Hunter Evans. Mayor, members of the council, my name is <clears throat> Hunter Evans. I reside at 2974 Evans Dairy Road, which is adjacent to the Cumberland County Business Center. And I would like for you to recall the meeting at the Crown when uh, Sanderson Farms, with Project Destiny, put forth the footprint of what is to take place within the park. The uh, crucial evidence or crucial information was left out and I would like to point this out with these maps if, <clears throat> if I could. <coughs> this dotted line is going to represent the Cape Fear River. This is the business center. What we have here are one, two, three, four parcels. This would be I-95. <coughs> these parcels here are options obtained by Sanderson Farms and these parcels are to be used as spray fields to spray the wastewater up to one and a half million gallons of water a day. And please note, everything is adjacent to or very close to the Cape Fear River. We already have an overloaded system. This parcel number four, which is located on Cedar Creek Road, is right next to the uh, assisted living Cumberland Village and extends to the end of Deep Creek Road. It also borders the Cape Fear River. This is uh, information I think that the City Council, Cumberland County Commissioners and the people in, in the city and the county should realize. Given that, I would like to read a statement right here, please. Uh, we asked the City Council to require a thorough, neutral, and comprehensive assessment of the environmental impacts be conducted as part of any agreement entered into with Sanderson to locate the plant in Cumberland County. <clears throat> An alternative, we asked the City Council to require an environmental impact study be conducted before the commissioners enter into any contract with Sanderson in the county. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Prince Tupman. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. My address is 5721 Azora Drive, Hope Mills, North Carolina, 28348. Um, as she said, my name is Prince Tupman. I'm one of the proud founders of the Outsider uh, Street Riders here in Fayetteville, along with the Social Club. Um, the reason I come to you this evening is to promote our food and clothes drive that we've been doing for the last uh, three and a half, four years. 
at the uh, abandoned parking lot next to uh, Kimball's Furniture. Uh, we're doing it again this Saturday, November 1st, from 10 to 3, where we'll be passing out uh, free food and uh, clothes that we picked up from various donations from members of the, of the bike community. Um, as I said, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we're just letting the city council know, and you know, sir, we're just not out here riding bikes and doing all this other stuff you might see or whatever. We're part of your, this community, too. We do care. I must, most of us here are in the military. I uh, used to be in the military, retired from officers on down. I myself, I'm, I just put in my uh, retirement paperwork. I'm about to retire after 25 years, 2015 Halloween. So we do care. Thank you. We do care about our community. We've done various things such as uh, school supplies, uh, collecting school supplies, uh, toys for the kids in K-Fair that won't be able to come home for Christmas this year, um, breast cancer awareness, lupus awareness. We're doing everything to show you that we're just not out here riding our bikes, throwing wild parties or whatever, that, like any, that, any negative that you may hear or see on the news. We're a community. This is our community. We're with y'all. Whatever we need to do to make a difference, I myself and the rest of the bike community here, we're tired of making a scratch. We want to make a dent. And we're just here to show everybody that this Saturday, as always, we're going to be in this community doing what we do best, which is giving back. Thank you. What do you ride? What do you ride? Um, I just got a 08 Road Glide, bright orange. Can't miss me, so don't hit me. Very don't nice. hit me. <laughs> Would uh, all the members of the, uh, the club stand, please? Thank you all for doing what you do. Look forward to riding with you sometime. Thank you. I, if, uh, please, if anybody has any clothes to donate from hats, shoes, blankets, whatever the case may be, please come on out this Saturday to the uh, abandoned parking lot next to Kimball. We're taking everything so we can give back to the community. I appreciate it, and God bless. Take care and Thank be safe. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Ride safely. Thank you. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Ronnie Peel. Mr. Ronnie Peel. Hey, Mr. Peel, how are you? Fine, fine, Mayor, City Council. My name is Ronnie Peel. I live at 210 Robin Oak Drive, Felvin, North Carolina. Matter of fact, I was born here. I was born in this building right here. I've been here for a long time. But I'll tell you something. I'm disappointed in the city council and PwC. You pick the people in PwC, if they don't agree with you, you need to go into a back room and discuss it. It don't need to be in the newspaper. Your dirty laundry needs to stay in. Now, PwC saves me $50 a month, $600 a year on my bill. I don't care what you do, but, but you take money from me, I'm not going to vote for you. You know, I need the money. Y'all might not need it, but, I mean, we got the best PwC going. And I don't know what the problem is. I don't want to know the problem because it doesn't concern me. It concerns y'all. But it don't concern the newspaper and everybody going. Where did Miss Daly go? Miss Daly. Ah. She went to talk to the motorcycle group. God. Well... That's this what I got to say. And uh, we go through this problem every time. I'm not going to say it's the city manager, but it seems like every time we get a new city manager, we have trouble with PwC, you know. And uh, if it was left up to me, I'd have to cut his pay about 100000 you know. I'm not trying to keep up with, with the Joneses. But, uh, but we need to stop and think about what's going on and uh, how, how you're hurting our citizens. And another thing. You know, I've called three or four of the city councilmen. The city, if it, you work for the people, if your telephone number is not up at the mayor's office, his number is not your number, your personal number. When you run for office, you can get a hold of you. But now, some of y'all you can't get a hold of because you have to call the mayor's office. And that's BS. You know, your number should be out for anybody can get a hold of and call you. I called Jim Mark. And I reamed him out the other day, just how I felt. And uh, he heard me. I this mean, is true. I mean, the bottom line is, 
I'm a citizen. I was born here. I'll probably die here. And uh, the bottom line is, y'all running the place, but let's get it together. Let's don't put our dirty laundry out for, for my daughter in Charlotte calls me and says, what's going on down there? You know, and it's a shame that I have to come up here and say, say, say that y'all, you know, y'all have embarrassed me. Y'all have embarrassed the whole city of Thelville. I thank you. Mr. Peel, I just want to be clear. This was not City Hall when you were born here. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. James Pop. Mr. James Pop. Name is James Pop, 101 Goodyear Avenue, 28303. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, thank you for hearing me out tonight. I just wanted to share my perspective on crime in my little portion of the city. Seems like it's out of control. I'm the one that's been communicating with you about the activities that are going on in the Roy Turner Jr. Park. October 8th, the Fayetteville Observer cited that there was a 6% drop in reported crime in the city. I feel the key word in that sentence is reported. Okay. Who fills out the reports? Who makes the reports that are counted? The citizens or the police? In the 22 times I have called 911 in the past six weeks, now just to be clear, that number includes 15 sex acts, three acts of drug crimes, and four cases of vandalism. Not one report has been written. Are we to believe that these crimes did not happen? August 17th, the Fayetteville Observer quoted the chief of police saying that officers have become gun shy and directed his officers to stop drivers who commit serious offenses and to not be concerned by what he called regulatory stops. I believe it's called dirty driving. So maybe prostitution and drugs in a city park is not a serious issue. But I can tell you, Mr. Mayor, it is a quality of life issue. Nobody wants to live next to a, next to a, board, a board, excuse me, bordello. In yesterday's Fayetteville Observer, it reported that there was a drop in overall crime in the last nine months compared to the same time frame last year. But the paper failed to mention the biggest causes for that crime drop. In January of this year, the jail expansion opened. On October 27, 2013, a year ago, the jail had 568 inmates. It was full. We remember the stories of criminals getting unsecured bond and being released due to no room in the jail and being arrested again and again. As of this morning, there was 752 inmates locked up. That's 184 more criminals locked up that would have been walking free this time last year. As a resident of this city, this council voted to raise my taxes to pay for more police officers. I would appreciate more effort to help curb the illegal activity in a city park named after one of its fallen officers. Thank you. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Donovan McGeechee. Mr. Donovan McGeechee. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Donovan McGeechee. I reside at 608 Duggins Way, Fayetteville, North Carolina. On April 14, 2014, I wrote a letter to Internal Affairs stating that I was uh, labeled a gang-affiliated member. In doing so, I became a victim of harassment and slander from some officials of the uh, Fayetteville Police Department, also some city employees as well. The reason I was labeled gang affiliated was not justified in any way by any law enforcement official. After I pursued answers from law enforcement, after I pursued answers, law enforcement used slander and unethical tactics such as harassment of the owners I was renting a property from, stating I was selling drugs and alcohol on the property. The Federal Police Department had no evidence uh, on this. I then again contacted Internal Affairs to receive help on the matter. Internal Affairs gave me no help at all. They instructed me that the Federal Police Department did their job and that there was nothing they could do. I then contacted the mayor's office and also city council for help because I feared I would lose my business and my name within the city. When I reached out to city council, there was only so much they could do. It all reflected back on whether or not the police department will resolve the matter. I stand here before you today having lost my business reputation tarnished and asking that 
this not happen to any other citizen here in Fayetteville, in the Fayetteville area. If there is no one to review the police department other than the police department, when will a citizen be able to seek justice? In 2013, Fayetteville Police Department hand-delivered letters banning all gang members, causing a confrontation between many citizens and police department from the um, Dogwood Festival. Many of these gang members were teens here in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. I asked you to seek answers on what qualified those teens to be considered gang members. Let me know if you receive answers. A young man recently was killed here in Fayetteville due to gang violence, and the Fayetteville Police Department had no leads and no cooperation from any teens or parents here in the city. Reason why I believe is the distrust and hand-delivered accusations of the proclaimed gang members here in Fayetteville Police Department. I ask the council to watch over the actions of those men and women who sworn to protect and serve. If not you, then who will seek justice for the citizens? Thank you. Now our next speaker is Miss Betty Jo Smith. Miss Betty Jo Smith. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Betty Jo Smith. I reside at 4340 Sids Mill Road, Federal NC, Cumberland County. I have been a lifelong member of Cumberland County, resident of Cumberland County, just retired from the school, so uh, school system as a school social worker, having served my 30 years of service. Um, numerous points have already been presented to y'all as to the reasons why we feel Sanderson Farm is not a good fit for the Cedar Creek Business Center or for Cumberland County as far as that goes. However, I feel it is important to point out the negative impact that Sanderson Farms will have on an already heavily populated, heavily trafficked school district that this business center encompasses, specifically Cape Fear High School, Mack Williams Middle School, JWC Brick, and Sunnyside Elementary Schools. With the addition of other surrounding elementary schools, these make up the attendance area number six. Our district encompasses the largest attendance area in Cumberland County. We cover approximately 45 percent of the land mass. Cape Fear High School is the fifth largest of the 15 high schools in Cumberland County. Mark Whitley, the planning supervisor for Cumberland County Schools, said that with Cape Fear's enrollment and Mack Williams' enrollment already, they're at capacity, and with the other number of the elementary schools, we feel like the volume of high school drivers with the regular drivers that drive in that area, that these are justifiable reasons for our concern over the volume of heavy, environmentally unfriendly traffic that Sanderson Farms will bring to this school district, an area with no stoplights to help regulate speed and traffic that is already a nightmare at times when trying to pull out on Cedar Creek Road. And if you Google Cumberland County Schools, you'll find different descriptions given for the areas. We are the only one that encompasses the rich, the poor, the medium, the all. Um, my point is here, residents in, in the area have been accused of being called NIMBYs, and to that I say we're guilty. Not only do we not want Sanderson Farms in our backyard, we don't want them in yours, and we don't want them in any backyard of Cumberland County. Is Sanderson Farm really the kind of business that we would see portrayed on this My Hometown Fevel video we just saw, the beautiful Cape Fear River, all those other beautiful places? Are we going to take a tour of the inside slaughterhouse? I don't think so. If we're to remain an all-American city, we cannot have the many negative effects that Sanderson Farm slaughterhouse is sure to bring. City Council and Mr. Mayor, you can do federal and Cumberland County much better than what you're proposing. It's time that you and the Alliance Group cut all ties with Sanderson Farms and bring us environmentally friendly business to the Cedar Creek Business Center. We would respectfully appreciate your willingness in rising to this challenge, as with this would be a great confidence builder for the community and county. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Bill Hurley. Greetings, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your public service, and I say that sincerely. Um, my, I'm here tonight. I know this is not a, a community agenda item right now, but it. It could be coming up again pretty seriously. This is an issue that I'm very concerned about that has not been mentioned thus far publicly as far as I know. 
Many of you know that for over 30 years now, a lot of us in this community, including you, have been working hard to improve the image of this city, not only for our region, but for North Carolina and the whole country. We've come a long way. We have a lot to be proud of. One problem that, I'm, that has not been mentioned that maybe we haven't thought of, but we should maybe get this out first, and that is the odor problem. We mentioned feathers before, but odor, we know we have valley protein on the river one mile from the market house. We know that with the chicken slaughterhouse, there's going to be a lot more of that gunk going into that feed processing plant. How many of you have or have not smelled from time to time the odor we have in our central city? With increased production, we have an issue, ladies and gentlemen, city council. I don't know how you're going to regulate odor. I don't know if it can be done. But if you want to drive the people out of downtown, if you want to kill, close the restaurant business, if that uh, situation does occur, a lot of our efforts in the past will be in vain. I don't think this plant would come within six miles of the city of Raleigh, Charlotte, Durham, Greensboro. There was no way it could come within six miles of a market house. And it's 6.6, .6 really, to this, this society plant. I wanted to bring that to your attention. I hope I haven't used all my time, but I'm very concerned about that. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you, sir. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Iman Iranami Mohammed. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. With the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, I greet you in peace. And that peace comes from God, not from man. That's the best peace you can have. I'd like to welcome everyone here and let it be known that I am a Vietnam vet, very much concerned about the growth and development of Fayette and Cumberland County and the great progress that we have made, we have much more to make. <coughs> Favor State University's homecoming is this week, so everybody get ready. Some of the 20,000 alumni have started coming into Favor State's campus already. The city of Fayetteville was host to the state NAACP conference last week, and since I am a Muslim and founder of the Muslim community of Fayetteville and Cumberland County, Masjid Omar Ibn Saeed, let it be known that the Muslim Congressman Keith Ellison spoke last Saturday at the Fuller Center on Bunch, off Bunch Road. Did a fantastic job with Reverend Barber and Maura Mundy. Also, it is time for Fayetteville to develop quickly and stop procrastinating the transit center that is supposed to be built in near proximity to here off Robinson Street, Robinson Road. We need that very badly. Raleigh has one, Durham has one. The, the one in Durham where the city manages from is fantastic, it's phenomenal. And we can do better than Durham, quite frankly. Also let it be known that PwC Board of Trustees meetings are open. We are, we are a city, a country of laws. Some of the meetings have become closed. Open those meetings back up and you will not have the city's budget cut $10 million. The state government will cut your budget if you don't follow the law. For you are over PwC, and we expect you to open the meetings. Lastly, let it be known that the Fine Arts Building uh, uh, right next to the uh, library downtown, that is not for lawyers and judges. We built that building when our good mayor was on the city council, Nat Roberts on the, on the uh, city council many years ago. We built that building for the Fine Arts Department. Fairfield State University professors came over and got with the city Fine Arts Department and built it for the children, the mothers, and the children when they come out with strollers and they want something for the children to do downtown for the little babies and their parents. Thank you very much. Mayor, our next speaker is Miss Tina Stoddard. Miss Tina Stoddard. Hello. Hi. Good evening, Mayor Robertson and Councilman. 
and women. Um, I'm a little anxious because this is the first time I've ever done this, but I hope I get my point across. The address I am wanting to present in front of you is 5111 Haddock Street. It's in the Bonnie Dune area. Um, this property was property of my grandmother. My mother was raised there, and I also raised my children there until they were in high school, and we moved after that. Um, I received a letter about four months ago. My father previously owned the property, then um, it was turned over and it was put into my husband's name about four years ago. Well, my husband and I have recently divorced. It's um, probably been about two years now, and during the divorce proceedings, the property was put over into my name. So, of course, all the you know problems and issues that go along with that were landed in my lap. Um, I received a letter from the city. I'm not exactly sure if it was Mr. Rutherford or not. I just received this letter, so I wasn't able to get all my paperwork together. But I had a hearing date with him. I went in and the person that actually sent the letter to me, giving me all of the different things that were wrong with the property, was not available. He was not working at the time. And so the gentleman that took over for him told me that, gave me a list of some of the changes that needed to take effect for the house. All of the, um, the stuff that was inside and the porch, anything that needed to be fixed to, um, to make it livable, as long as I boarded the house, this is what I was told, as long as the house was boarded, the boards were colored to match the house, and the yard and all of the surroundings were cleaned up, then the inside you know, would not be an issue. Um, I did that, I had everything cleaned up, spoke to Mr. Dewberry, he met me out there on the property. He said he was in charge of all of the, um, the environmental stuff, so every, all of that was taken care of. He approved all of the cleanup. Um, and I also own the property that's connected to the, the 5111 Haddock Street and all the way around the property. So actually we own that whole corner section. Um, but as what he told me was everything was taken care of. And then I assumed that everything inside of the house didn't need it to be taken care of. And then I received this letter stating that it was gonna be demolished after the 90 days was up. And I was not aware that that was gonna happen. And I just wanted to see if that could be postponed or if we could get some other kind of arrangement going on so that I could keep the house. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May we have reached the 30 minutes. Okay, that will end tonight's public forum. Thank you very much for being here. Next is a report from our boards and commissions. We we'll ask uh, Residential Rental Property Review Board annual report. <coughs> Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. It's my privilege to be able to brief you tonight, and thanks for all, all you do for the city. I am not hostile. I'm Chet Omi, a 30-year Air Force veteran. I still love Mr. Crisp and have been in property management for 31 years in Fayetteville. Tonight I will brief you on the Residential Property Review Board. The ordinance that allows this board was completed and adopted in July of 2012. It is the result of the Rental Action Management Program, or better known as RAMP. As many of you know, the city staff has been working on an inspection program since August of 2007. We've had many ups and downs in ramp, but have now have a viable working program. I have a great board comprised of seven individuals, two appointed by the mayor, one by the city manager, and four by you, the council. The Residential Rental Re uh, Property Review, Bo Review Board considers appeals of property owners required to register their properties for disorder activity of registration for or certain code violations. The board's purpose is to ensure an opportunity for review of such ramp reservations and revocations. Decisions of the board are appealable 
to the city council. The process begins with a written appeal of an issued registration notice or registration revocation notice. The appellant shall have a written notice of appeal to the city clerk within 10 days of receiving notice of the action being appealed. The board should conduct the appeal hearing within 30 days of the date of appeal. The police officer or development services official shall prepare a summary of the case including all relevant data. The summary shall be promoted, provided to the board and the owner at least five working days before the hearing. Before the appeal is heard by the board, staff reviews the appeal for timeliness and the basis for the appeal. If the appeal is justified, staff will administratively correct the adverse action taken against the appellant without the need of setting the appeal for a hearing before the board. If staff finds that the appeal is justified, the appeal is set for a hearing before the board at the next scheduled meeting date. Staff prepares all he hearing notices and case documents for the board and the appellant. The purpose of the appeal hearing before the board shall be determined whether or not the staff has met the statutory requirements to require registration or renovation of registration. The appellant is entitled to make any statement or present or present any witnesses on his or her behalf. After hearing evidence, the board will either grant or deny the appeal. The appellant has the right to appeal the board's decision, decision to the city council. The city council shall make its decision based on the record. A majority vote by the city council in favor of the board's decision is required to uphold the board decision. If the city council upholds the board's decision, the appellant shall have the right to seek judicial review of the board's decision. City council has heard one appeal and an advice from the city council, a city attorney remanded the case back to the board to allow a record to be established. The board again denied the appeal. A total of eight appeal hearings have been heard by the board, one in 2013 and seven in 2014. Four appeals were approved and four were denied. The increase in the number of appeals in 2014 is attributed to an increased ability to track and process related violations. So far we have had 1,415 cases in the city of Fayetteville from the police and the development services officers, 82 are still active. We've had 13 registrations, five are off the list, and eight are still active. In conclusion, the city staff is currently in the process of preparing a set of amendments after evaluation of the program for two years. We're trying to tweak the entire ordinance. The police and development service officers have been a great asset to this program and are very dedicated. We are still having problems with the correct address on tax records. As you know, the city inspectors, if they find a violation, they send it to the owner that's on the tax record. Unfortunately, in Fayetteville, we have so many military that have been PCS and continually moved that their records are in very poor shape. I am currently working with the county tax office to come up with a program where professional property managers can assist in updating their records. And this is most important to our owners because of your reevaluation coming up in 2017. Also, House Bill 773, which covers inspections for the state, has been in the Commerce Committee since 2013. However, will probably surface again when the state session reopens in January. I'm trying to set up a meeting next month with the mayor, city staff, and our state association government affairs officer, and Senator Meredith, who is on the committee, because our city staff has some disagreement with the proposed bill. What also I would like to thank is Andy Barksdale for his article at the beginning of October, which indicated about the RAP program, and since my, he mentioned my name, unfortunately, I've had a lot of calls in trying to explain the program. 
This concludes the briefing. Thank you for listening. The board needs your support, and if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. And also, I have Mr. Rutherford here with me, who's the development's officer. Are there any questions? We do uh, have a question or statement. Mayor Pro Tem Davy. Thank you so much for your presentation. We're so proud to know that you all are working really hard on the RAMP program. And thank you so much for providing. That was going to be my questions, what suggestions you all had to revamp and, and make sure that this program is doing exactly what you need it to do for the community. Um, so I'm glad that you all are being very proactive about getting engagement on this early before the General Assembly starts again. So thank you so much. And please keep us informed with what's going on. I, I think that it's an education process with all of our landlords. We had a landlord come in last week, had a tenant that could not speak English. My questions to him as a professional property manager, what kind of lease do you have for him? What kind of background? Have you checked IDs, credit reports, or anything? So uh, let me just say one thing. About six years ago, Chief Bergermine, we had a, the association put on a session with an attorney, with two magistrates, with police officers, and also inspectors. And that's when we were having the trouble in A and B Street. And we invited 178 property owners. And we had all the brochures there and everything for them and all the speed. We had one couple show up. So we want to try that again, but we have to have the interest of these landlords. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your, your work. <coughs> Council, we'll move to 8.0, which is the consent agenda. Mr. Ars. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I would move that the council approve the consent agenda with the following modifications. That item 8.024, uh, be modified, specifically the address of 511 Haddock Street, uh, be taken off of the consent agenda for consideration at the November 3rd uh, council work session. And that item 10.02 uh, be moved to the con consent agenda for acceptance and funding. 10.02 to appear on the consent. And 5111 Haddock Street, which is item uh, a part of item 8.024 to be uh, tabled until November 3rd. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Mayor. Right. Mr. Wright, you had a couple of changes as well. Oh uh, Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would move that we pull for future discussion uh, until next month uh, items 8.011, 8.0. 14 and 8.015. 8.011, 8.014, 8.015 to come back at a later date. Yes, sir. Okay. Recognize that motion by Mr. Arp, seconded by Mr. Wright. I made the motion. Okay. I made the motion. I'll over second there. it. Very good. All right. Well, oh, are those. Okay. Those are two. Those are two separate motions. How about how about Mr. Mayor? Which since we can't have two separate motions, I'll accept the friendly amendment Mr. Wright offered to my motion. Absolutely. I Very second. good. Very good. And Mr. Wright's a second. Council uh, discussion on the motion, please. Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote on item 8.0 with uh, changes. <clears throat> oh, I gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> that is nine to one with Mr. Moan voting against. Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, Mr. Hume while you're getting ready here. We'll take a five minute break, please.
Okay. Council, at this time we'll move into the public hearings. Individuals wishing to speak at a public hearing should have signed up with the city clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. 15 minutes will be allowed for each side of the issue being discussed. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes unless your group wishes to appoint just one speaker. <clears throat> Time used in response to a question from city council members will not be counted against your time. Discussion following the public hearing will be limited to this body only unless someone from uh, this chair recognizes you for a question. So when your name is called by the city clerk, we ask that you come to the podium, clearly state your name and home address for the record. Then when you see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, you have 30 seconds left to speak. When you see the red light come on, your time has expired. And again, due to uh, policy restrictions, we are unable to extend that time. Thank you, Mr. Hume. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is a public hearing for a new uh, bus route, route number, we've numbered number 11. And uh, this is the route that I uh, reviewed with you back in September related to our uh, partnership with Fayetteville State. It's the policy of FAST that no significant changes in service or fares will be implemented without affording the community and the public an opportunity to comment on those changes. And that is the reason for our public hearing uh, today because this is, a new route is considered a major uh, change. Uh, this is the, uh, this is a route that we, uh, this is a route that we proposed, uh, and uh, it is one that runs along Ramsey Street from Andrews Road down to Country Club, Country Club over to Murkison, Murkison down to Fayetteville State, then back, back to Country Club Hemley over to uh, to the mall. Uh, for besides providing service to the Fayetteville State, it also uh, fills in a gap of service that we've been working on for some time along Country Club Hamley. We've not had service there. Uh, the map just shows landmarks. It doesn't show the, all the stops that we will be implementing as we put in this route, but just major, major landmarks. Uh, it, it is a route. Again, although Fayetteville State is helping us pay for this route, it is open to the public. Uh, we have uh, scheduled it to sort of fit into the budget that it would operate from 6.30 uh, in the morning to uh, 2 p.m. with one bus. So it's two hour headway at that time. And then at two o'clock, about around 2, 2.30, we'd be adding a bus. And then it would run till 8.30, except on uh, Friday and Saturday evenings. And Friday and Saturday evenings, it would run till uh, 10.30, which is when most of our services, night services end. Uh, we, we have uh, tried to engage the public. We have flyers that we've, we put out at the transit center and on our buses. Uh, we had flyers that we put out at Fayetteville State and at Miller Mott. Uh, college. Uh, we had two public workshops over the last couple of weeks, uh, one at Miller Mott and one at Fire Station 14 next to Fayetteville State. And then we uh, had, had some customer face-to-face -face meetings uh, at the Transit Center. And then tonight's public hearing. We've had 14 comments so far. Our 14 people attended our, uh, our meetings. All of them were positive. The only suggestions that we had was to extend the hours Monday through Thursday to 1030. Uh, we don't have the budget to do that yet, but it's something that we will continue to work on. Thank you, Mr. Hume. Madam Clerk. May we just have one speaker for this item in opposition, Mr. Iman Iranami Mohammed. We have no further speakers, All right. Mayor. We will open and close the public hearing. Council, is there a discussion or a motion? So, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Davey first. Thank you. I was going to make the motion, but I will hold off if people have some more discussion. Okay, Mr. Colvin. Mr. Hume, I, I really uh, appreciate the expansion of these routes. I think it's well needed, um, you know, for for, ver for various reasons. I have a couple questions now. <clears throat> I've, I've witnessed a, a few places on the existing route that don't have seats, don't have co uh, shelter, and so as we as we expand our routes, um, what is the plan uh, of your department to help with some of the bitch seating and, and, and some of the other needs that exist? Yes, sir. We, we, we've adopted, you all have adopted service standards that outline where we will place shelters and benches, and it's based on how much they are used. And so we're looking at those regularly, and of course, then we get suggestions for them, too, and we will check those those spaces. We have several that we're working on right now. Again, when we add a bench or shelter, we have to make that location ADA accessible, and sometimes that's what takes some time, uh, particularly along state, state 
roadway. So that requires a pad uh, as well as uh, sidewalks leading to that pad. But we are working on several of those. Uh, in fact, we had a meeting today of several that we're getting ready to go out for bid to be able to install those. And again, we, we, we talked last week, I think, about a couple of locations you were concerned about. Ms. Jensen. My question was basically the same um, question, but the one that we're looking at Ramsey Street, I guess the two new stops, have y'all already put padding there for them? We, we have pads on uh, North Ramsey, north of, uh, of Methodist. Right. We, we, we were able to put, put bus pads in when they did the sidewalk project. The state did that at that time, and it, we were able to do it together. Uh, on the other side of the street is where we're doing the the construction project near the uh, near the apartments uh, on down there uh, between Andrews Road and Methodist, and that that is a location where there are no side there's sidewalks on one side of the street. There's no sidewalks on the other, and so okay. we're we we have a project that we're getting ready to bid where we will be adding sidewalk there so we can put in the bus stop. Okay, so these are on the right side of the road as you're going t north on Ramsey Street. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, thank you, Mr. Art. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Hume, I just want to take take a second here to to, to try to add in. This is this is a great initiative, and uh, I think it's good for uh, our students at Fayetteville State. But I want to ask very briefly about the high school passes. Um, do we have any updates on the high school passes and the kids that are using that? How many kids are using these passes? We, we have none that are using it. We uh, we sent something out last week the, to all the. Uh, we sent it through school transportation to all the athletic directors and to the principals and to a couple of counselors that we have worked with. Uh, we have one counselor that has come back to us to ask for those passes, but they are available now. The application that we want them or the form we want them to fill out is also online, and we have a place on our website uh, where, we're, where we're doing that. But, we're, again, we're managing that through uh, the schools, through the athletic directors and through the uh, school principals. But, but to date, we've not had any, any high school we, we, we've not issued any passes yet, but we have those available, and we, we hopefully will this week. Mr. Chris. Mr. Hume. Randy, I think I'm often getting questions. I'm often getting questions about why no benches and shelters. And I think the citizens need to understand that on these thoroughfares that belong to North Carolina DOT, we don't have the exclusive say-so to put shelters and benches. That's correct. Also, they need to understand there's a considerable cost involved uh, when you start putting simply a bench because it's got to be ADA compliant, non-skid, all of that, as well as about thirteen thousand dollars for a shelter, right? Uh, somewhere between ten and twelve thousand dollars for shelter. Ten and twelve. That's what I, we normally use. I was yes, counting sir. inflation in there. <laughs> How are you going to get that message across? Because I keep getting inquiries from people, for example, on Strickland Bridge Road. Why no buses and shelters? And, of course, there's a ridership involved yes, yes. and a bench, 10 or less, or, or 10 or more, 24 shelter. That's more. correct. Yes, How are you going to get that information out? Well, we've, uh, I mean, we, again, we entertain requests for them all the time, and we try to explain it that, at that time. Again, we have several locations that we've identified where we have that type of ridership that we're uh, wanting to install shelters or benches. And, uh, again, that, that are, those are the ones we're working on right now. Uh, again, we, we have those service standards that have been adopted uh, by, by you all, and uh, that's what we try to follow as we do that. And we, we have one exception to that is that uh, we do have a program we've been working on for people that want to sponsor uh, and, and really pay, this, pay the local share for that. For, for, for the city. Uh, and so on those situations, we're a little more lenient in terms of the ridership. Uh, let me be very direct. Yes, sir. How are you going to keep them from calling me for me to explain all of this to the riders and citizens? That's my question. I know the answers, but I don't know whether there's some changes that have taken place. For example, I said about thir I told somebody the shelter costs about 13 grand. And you say 12, so I've overstated the case, all right? But there are other council members that may have these questions asked of them. And how do we get that information to those citizens? Maybe a flyer to us so that we have the answers readily available. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Mr. Wright? Uh, yes, yeah, just a uh, follow-up question on uh, Mr. Chris. 
um, question. I noticed that some buses stop in the middle of the road, like on Rayford Road for bus stops. There is no nowhere for them to go. And they pick up they pick up um, pedestrians from there. Uh, I w- inquired about a bus stop on um, Raleigh Road, past <coughs> Cliffdale Road, past that McDonald's going hitting Rim Road. There's no bus stop there. Uh, and when I inquired, it said DOT. It's a DOT road. I, I don't know that it has to be a bus stop or a curve or something put there. Um, we really need to look at that because. The citizens walk about about a mile to get to a bus stop to get to work. And so we could really look at that area right there and see if we could do something. Uh, And if that's the case, what can we do to make that happen? Thank you. Mr. McDougall. Number one, I'd like to echo the thought of uh, Council Member Chris. I get that question all the time. And I do tell them 12,000, but they don't back up. Uh, secondly, I was also asked by the community there, by FSU, uh, the reason for not bringing the bus all the way down to, like, Coley and maybe turning and even going across the campus or coming down Coley and turning out. I, I did tell them, and I thought just from being at the fact meeting was the delay in that light not being a, a normal sort of light there. I thought that's, that's what you all told me. That's correct. We, 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 we did look at that uh, when we met with, with uh, the Fayetteville State uh, people, and uh, we looked to see if we could make that turn and go down that way. Uh, the, the, difficult, the difficulty it is, is you know, there is housing over there. Of course, the, the other uh, residential housing on, on, the, uh, on the campus uh, would be farther from. The other was when we, the, we tested it, uh, that light did not always change when we were sitting in, when, with our vehicle sitting in the left turn re- lane. And so the Traffic would be released to come toward us. The traffic would cross, released to come toward us, and our, our light would never change until someone came to the right-hand lane. So I'm not sure why that was doing that with our vehicle. That, that's, what, that's what occurred. It was not something that we could work out with DOT or with uh, traffic services? We, 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 again, we can work on that and see what we can do. But again, I think the, uh, as we were meeting with Federal State, they eventually agreed that what we we'd planned to do was – was a good service that they would that they would do but we, we will continue to work with them yes sir. mayor pro tem davy thank you mr hume for your presentation at this time i'd like to move for the motion to approve the new transit route second number four um transit route number 11 I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Davey, seconded by Councilmember McDougall. Is there a discussion on the motion? Mr. Crisp, are you voting or you got a? Okay. All right, Council, I'll ask you to push buttons. Madam Clerk, that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.02 is the issuance of a special use permit to allow daycare center in SF6, which is a single family residential district located on Powell Street. <laughs> Mr. Harmon. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Since this is a special use permit request, if we could get all the speakers who have signed up uh, to join me over here with uh, our clerk so they can be sworn in. No, we have no speakers for the special use permit item. Well, that was easy enough. That was easy. We'll open and close that public hearing. Council. Yeah. We're still, yeah. I'm still going to be sworn up, making sure everything is okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth? So help you God. Okay. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. I'd like to make a motion. To allow the special use permit. I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, this is a special use permit, yes, so ma'am. we will need um, the presentation of staff uh, before you can move forward with uh, a motion. All right. Thank you, Madam Attorney. Mr. Harmon. Yeah. We just need this for the record. I'll try to be brief since we have no speakers. 
Uh, crested action is a special use permit for a daycare to be located at 1719 Powell Street. Uh, give you an idea of where that is. Uh, the property actually fronts Powell and backs up to Gillespie. Uh, it's near the intersection of, uh, of Gillespie where Trade Street comes off of Gillespie and heads towards Southern Avenue. Uh, this is a previous daycare that was run by the church uh, that's beside of it, uh, but now a single individual is looking to open as a daycare, and so they need a special use permit for that. Uh, currently out in that area, uh, mainly low-density residential uh, on the north side of Gillespie, uh, with the exceptions being uh, business uh, to the east and the church to the west uh, and then to the south across Gillespie uh, commercial and industrial uses. Land use plan calls for heavy commercial across the street uh, across Gillespie from the property and medium density residential on this particular property. Um, this is a photo of the front of the home from Powell Street and this is a photo of the rear of the home from Gillespie uh, the conditions uh, that have been offered in this case are operating Monday through Friday, all shifts and weekends, no more than 25 children at a time, no more than 10 employees, and removal of the fencing uh, in the front of the property to comply with the UDO. Uh, zoning Commission and staff both recommend approval. That's based on the property served as daycare in the past. Property is located uh, along a major thoroughfare. Property meets distance requirements set by the UDO, uh, and there are heavy commercial uses and zoning on three sides of the property. Any questions on this particular case? Mayor Pro Tem Davey. Thank you for the presentation. At this time, I will move to allow the special use permit for the daycare center located at 1719 Powell Street. Second. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Council Member Wright. Council, is there discussion on the motion, please? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote. Madam Clerk, Madam Attorney, that's unanimous. Item 9.03, rezoning a property from single family uh, 10 residential to, I'm not wearing my glasses, LCCZ, limited commercial. Mr. Yeah, this property is located at the southwest corner of the intersection of Fisher and Lakewood Roads. Uh, give you an idea of where this property is again, uh, Lakewood here, Fisher here. Uh, to the east, uh, you're going toward Bingham Drive to the west um, near um, uh, Strickland Bridge. Thank you. Uh, mine's slipping there. Uh, to the east, you also have the uh, elementary school and middle school here uh, and some newer single-family residential developments uh, kind of surrounding the uh, west and south side of the property. Uh, property is, is currently in several things of uh, undeveloped to, to single-family residential. Uh, you can also see that there are a lot of uh, single-family residential around that area along with the two blues being the school there to the east. Uh, our land use plan does call for uh, low-density residential on this particular tract. <clears throat> This is a photo taken uh, looking at the intersection there from uh, Fisher and Lakewood. And then this is just uh, along Lakewood looking into the property. Uh, this is a conditional zoning again. And as part of the conditions, the applicant has offered up uh, this sketch plan, uh, which was set aside a little over 10 acres uh, to be used for multifamily development. <coughs> Uh, a little over 15 acres for commercial development, and then another three point, 
about 3.4 acres for commercial or professional development. Um, along with that, the developer has had uh, uh, talks with DOT, and uh, should this project go forward, DOT uh, is going to allow them to put a stoplight uh, at this uh, area here so that uh, they would have an entrance straight across from one of the entrances to the school, and the school system is very much in favor of that aspect. Um, conditions, uh, again, the sketch plan that we just looked at, uh, the following types of businesses would be omitted uh, from the allowed uses uh, in this conditional district, uh, room and boarding house, drug alcohol treatment, tattoo parlor, body, body piercing, electronic gaming, tobacco shop, uh, and then <clears throat> with the exception of the utilities installations, uh, the applicant ag agrees to not clear the multifamily area or commercial professional areas until he's ready to develop them. Um, those are the areas you saw on the, uh, over, on the aerial map that uh, still have uh, trees on them. Um, in addition to those conditions, uh, staff would, for their uh, approval, would require that uh, if approved that the sidewalks uh, be care and <clears throat> she had the characteristics of those described in the southwestern Cumberland northeastern Hoke multimodal congestion plan uh, exclude gas stations from the list of allowed uses add an alternative sign package uh, for coordinated signage and to limit it, limit the number of uh, pole signs on the property uh, and to limit parking areas along Fisher and Lakewood frontages to no more than 50% inclusive of uh, access drives. Um, and with that, just a few photos of, of what, you know, st what staff means by some of their comments, some of the developments. Um, these are in some other places. We have a few around this way, but not many yet. Um, basically bringing some of the buildings closer to the road um, like you'll see in several of these pictures um, this one this photo is actually uh, just down the road from the property uh, at Lakewood and um, uh, yeah Stony Point <laughs> can't remember my roads tonight here um, and so these are some examples of, of what staff means by uh, bringing the limiting the parking areas uh, uh, along the road frontages, having the buildings closer to the road. Um, another aspect that staff has has looked at that they'd like to see is something more of a uh, uh, internal drive that's more like a road where you can actually have on street parking in front of the businesses as well. Um, Zoning Commission did recommend approval uh, that was based on uh, those conditions offered by the owner only. Uh, the owners did uh, amend their conditions at the uh, Zoning Commission meeting and added uh, tobacco shops to their list that was uh, not in there before the meeting uh, and that they would meet uh, the city's current development standards. Um, staff recommends approval only if conditions offered by the owner and staff are included, uh, and that's based on conditions offered by the owner uh, and those required by staff. Um, and while the land use plan calls for low-density residential on the property, there is an electric transmission line that crosses the property and makes it a less desirable single-family uh, residential development. Uh, the proposed multifamily sections of the development would help buffer surrounding single family from retail and office uses. Uh, the immediate area is currently uh, almost entirely residential or institutional, uh, unless the development's done consistent with a mixed use pedestrian oriented neighborhood form, uh, it should not be approved. And then lastly, with the addition of conditions, uh, the development would have <clears throat> most of the flexibilities of the LC zoning districts with a few characteristics that would help protect uh, the values and stability of residential areas uh, 
more in common with our neighborhood commercial districts. Any questions of staff before you open your public hearing? Mr. Hurst. Uh, Mr. Harmon. Uh, Mr. Harmon. Um, I was just curious on the October 14th Zoning Commission meeting. Usually the Zoning Commission's unanimous. This was split. Any it particular was. reason why there, there were a couple that opposed? Um, I, again, I think uh, I'm not sure exactly what the, the ones in opposition really were because they weren't near as vocal as the ones in favor. Um, I really thought it was going to be maybe a higher vote before they took the vote. So it kind of surprised me a little that it split that closely. Mr. Wright. Yes, sir, Mr. Harmon. Um, I know you talked about the uh, the traffic, the traffic light. You know, it's right across from a, a school. Uh, can, can you give us a little bit more on uh, how do you think the, the traffic is going to flow, the congestion of it, and what have you done to to prepare for that? Well, again, it, it, this uh, Lakewood uh, being a DOT street, um, DOT is the ones who uh, – They've been meeting with uh, the developer, although they have been meeting with city staff as well to get uh, the city's uh, streets uh, people involved. Um, and basically, uh, the lower entrance to the elementary school down here, there's a, a real issue, it seems, now uh, in the mornings and afternoons of getting buses and cars in and out of the school at the same time. Uh, and so the school system along with DOT, feels that uh, adding that stoplight and having this development's uh, one of its entrances straight across from an entrance to the school uh, will help with a lot of that congestion. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jensen. Um, living on Ramsey Street and going through the median ordeal, um, you know, my neighborhood realized that with the medians, we got a stoplight, so it made the hit a little bit easier for us. I guess my question is, if this does not get approved, do they still get the stoplight? Not at this point in time. Okay. That would be a DOT project in the future at some point. Okay. All right. Mr. Moan? Well, thank you for the presentation. This question might be for you, Mr. Harmon, or it could be for Mr. Shuford, um, and it, it uh, relates to the, um, the capacity of our existing limited commercial or zone properties throughout the city and whether we have excess that's not being used uh, and be, you know, before we continuously rezone um, you know, residential properties for commercial. Uh, I'm just, do you have a ballpark figure? And I don't know if he has to be sworn in or not, since it's a. It's, it's not a. It's, okay. It's not special. special use, just conditional. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Moan. Um, as we presented to City Council on a couple of occasions, um, there is indeed an excess of commercially zoned property in the city, and um, that's one reason why we prefer to use the conditional zoning approach to uh, make sure that what is being proposed is not speculative in nature and simply a straight rezoning. Uh, so um, we did uh, think about uh, long and hard whether or not this, um, this particular additional commercial made sense in the, the realm of the greater city uh, and came to the conclusion that uh, if it was conditioned as has been presented by Mr. Harmon, uh, it would be something that we thought was a good trade-off. Um, having said that, um, I, I do again want to caution uh, council on the the large number of uh, commercial acres that we have that are uh, not uh, not being fully utilized in, in the current state, uh, but uh, we we are going to be um, headed towards the development of a comprehensive plan, uh, which will help us understand uh, all these relationships in greater detail, and we won't be relying on a um, uh, a um, uh, a land use plan that is uh, is somewhat outdated. Thank you. All right, Council, no further questions. We'll move into the public hearing. Madam Clerk. May we have seven speakers on this item. The first five are speaking in favor. <coughs> the first speaker is Mr. Stephen Riley. 
Sorry? No, sir. Just don't swear at us. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Riley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, at the present time, my name is Steve Riley, 5849 Fisher Road, 28304 is the zip. Uh, I live on the said property, have all my life, okay? So for my sister and I to take it up that we're going to get rid of the family farm and get rid of the family land, uh, this was not taken very lightly, you know. I mean, Lance, you've been on all your life. It's kind of hard just to walk away. Uh, we were there. Grandfather came out there in 39. We've been there. Roads were dirt. <coughs> Nobody else was out there. It was all farmland. Since then, development has done what it's done. It's a little too crowded. You know, we're no longer Route 3, <laughs> which was pretty neat. We're no longer Route 3, but we're a road name. And so we just deal with that. But it's, 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 it's come time for me and my sister to want to sell this property, move on, move to a little place that's a little quieter, uh, and, and just get, and get away from everything that's there now, uh, not that was there when we started. So since we have become a part of the city, uh, not totally, you know, we, but we're there. So uh, we, would like, we would like to sell it. Uh, we feel really good about our developer because we don't think he's going not to not respect the land that we have. Uh, this past summer, we planted sunflowers in our field. And uh, it was pretty good. It was for my bees. Me and wife like them. But, uh, you know, any given day, there'd be 10 to 20 people in my sunflower field. They'd park up and down the road. They didn't ask permission. It was their given right just to go out in our field and take pictures. And most of the folks were really good. They really were. I mean, we lost some sunflowers. And we had... Seven people out of the hundreds that went in the field, we had seven people that asked for permission. But it was just a little bit too pushy on everybody else's part on us. I mean, you didn't mind them being there, but the same token, I didn't ask them to come. And so I was asked if I'd do it again, and I really don't know <laughs> if I'd do it again. But uh, that kind of thing is what's making me want to leave. So, you know, it's home, but uh, it's time to go. Find something rural, you know. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mayor, our next speaker is Miss Laurie Epler. <coughs> that shows the intersection of Lakewood and Fisher Roads. That map shows a roundabout at that intersection with two lanes of traffic going in every direction and sidewalks on both sides of the road. I sincerely hope that planning does not expect Mr. Riddle to build this road for this development, but that's what their condition for approval says because that's what's in this document. If you'll go on the next sheet, Rural Village Main Street, that's what they recommend for Lakewood Drive. You have a sidewalk zone, a green zone with trees. You're going from one side of the right of way to the other across the street. Sidewalk, green zone, 
parking. That's parallel parking on the side of the road. Shared vehicle zone, which I guess is like a high occupant, occupancy vehicle lane. Uh, beside that is a motor vehicle zone, then a bicycle zone, more parking on the other side of the street, a green zone with trees, and an extra wide sidewalk. That's what they want on Lakewood Drive. The next page shows you what they want on Fisher Drive in cross section, or on Fisher Road. Sidewalk, green with landscaping, shared vehicle, two, two lanes. Um, wide median with landscaping in the middle, motor vehicle zone, two more lanes, Bi bicycle zone, green zone with landscaping, and another sidewalk. That's what that multimodal plan calls for on these two streets. Planning hasn't told us we're only required to do that on our side of the street. They haven't told us we have to build, they've not given us any direction on what we're supposed to agree to in these conditions that they've put on this approval. We've made every effort to deal with staff. We initially came in with a straight LC zoning. We went to the zoning commission, found out they were given information from an application that was filed by a previous development over a year before. We deferred it. He had a contract go hard date. He had to have a decision from council by tonight. We dealt with staff, we back and forth over conditions. It's been an arduous process, but Mr. Riddle has gone above and beyond trying to satisfy staff on this. And still we have more conditions. They want us to put our buildings right up on the street What's going to happen when Lakewood Drive or Fisher Road need to be widened? You're going to have to condemn his buildings. Thank you, Ms. Epler. Thank you. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Jonathan Charleston. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, member of the city council, my name is Jonathan Charleston. My address is 201 Hay Street, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm here tonight on behalf of the property owners and the developer, uh, all of whom reside here in the city. I'm gonna start out by saying that uh, the owners, the property owners and the developer ultimately would like to do just like you and I, and that seek the highest and best use of their property. Everyone wants to do that. Tonight, the property owners request that City Council follow the recommendation of the Zoning Commission and rezone this property from single family 10, uh, single family 10 to LC, uh, LZ with conditions. Those conditions are set forth in your package. As Mr. Riley mentioned earlier, uh, this property has been used for uh, rural purposes uh, for probably since the, the 1930s and uh, they had come to enjoy that type of use and quite frankly the character of the area is has changed and will continue to change from a rural setting to that of a more commercial setting as miss epler pointed out uh, the recommendations of the planning staff contain what we believe to be some un additional but unreasonable conditions she mentioned the multimodal quite frankly uh, we studied that, tried to figure out what's intended by it, but it hasn't been fully developed by your, your staff, and we would suggest that that be left out. I think there was some question about the, uh, the split on the, uh, on the zoning commission. I think probably they didn't understand it, just like we didn't understand some aspects of it. One of the uh, members of the zoning commission was trying to understand why the, uh, the multimodal uh, requirements were being uh, imposed on this particular piece of property. Again, I would point out that the character of this area has changed substantially, and the, uh, the current property owners should not bear the burden of the changes in the area. So let's talk for a minute about why it makes sense to grant this request. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the most fundamental and treasured principle in the United States of America is that property owners should be allowed to develop their property to its highest and best use. 
And it's, it gets kind of difficult when you live in, a, in an urban environment because from time to time you have planners that come in that uh, want to impose restrictions on your property. I want to tell you, Mr. Mayor, what color your house should be, you know. And uh, those restrictions in this case, I would suggest, are substantially more burdensome than they need to be. So I would only argue that the burden of the, uh, the changes in this condition should not be borne by the by the property owners, and we will respectfully ask you to uh, follow the recommendation of the Zoning Commission. Thank you. I might add that there was an email that I have here that indicates it was questioning why a gas station is even mentioned there and why was there an issue regarding the gas station. This is from the planning staff, and they said, I think just because Scott sees that as an objectionable. I, I don't think that that's a reasonable standard. That's a subjective standard. We should deal with objective standards. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Lonnie Player. Good evening, Mr. Player. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, you've heard uh, from my colleague, Mr. Charleston, uh, you've heard from Ms. Epler, and you've heard most importantly from the property owner uh, about why this uh, rezoning is sought. Uh, we have been fortunate to receive zoning commission approval. We have uh, voluntarily given up five potential uses of this property. They're included in your packet. Most importantly, we've agreed that the back half, the half which would abut the existing neighborhoods, uh, but for the installation of utilities to service the commercial portion would remain wooded and would remain as a buffer zone until such time as uh, Mr. Riddle uh, deemed it feasible and appropriate to build multifamily, uh, not commercial, multifamily uh, residential housing on that tract. And that might be never. This could well be a 15-year plan we're talking about. We have no leases in place. We have no deals even at the, uh, at the, at the real talking stage at this point. Uh, nothing committed to writing. What we have is an opportunity to procure property uh, from the Rileys and allow them to move on with their lives as they, uh, as they wish to do and as you've heard tonight. Um, you've heard from staff themselves that this property currently zoned SF10 is bad um, for its current zoning in that it has a large, uh, I believe it's a Duke Power transmission line easement running across it. That is a high tension transmission line. You can't build houses under it. And it cuts, it bisects the property diagonally. It'd be very difficult to locate a neighborhood there to lay one out. That's why one is not there. If um, the additional uh, requirements uh, suggested by staff are, uh, are uh, allowed by council tonight, that will likely result in Mr. Riddle not closing upon the property. And the practical ramification with that of that, I would submit to the council, would be that uh, it is likely that the Rileys and the Stricklands would not be able to sell their property to anyone in the near future, given its unsuitability in its current zoning, uh, in its current zoning state. I would also point out that the, uh, though the school, uh, school board cannot take a position with respect, uh, affirmative or negatively, with respect to our application, uh, they are in favor of the signal uh, that, is to be, uh, that is to be located to uh, service the elementary school throat uh, there, I believe, on Lakewood, uh, on Lakewood Drive. I would point out to the council and remind the council that Mr. Riddle is paying for that signal out of his own pocket. He's also paying for uh, turn and decel lanes on Fisher Road, excuse me, on Lakewood Drive to service that throat. That would not happen if he does not close on this property. Uh, finally, I would point out to the council that of the hundreds of homes within the area uh, that would be notified of our uh, zoning, uh, of, of our request for a rezoning, only two folks have shown up <coughs> in our position tonight. I think that the silence speaks volumes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Player. Where is our sergeant of arms? Just kidding. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Madam Clerk. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Joe Riddle. Okay, we will have time for questions, but we'll put them on last speaker. 
Sister Mary, your rules don't allow um, time for rebuttal. Certainly, if council wants to suspend, no, suspend those rules, then you can. But under your current rules, uh, there is no rebuttal time. If we just move them to the last speaker, is that allowed? Is that considered a rebuttal? Under your rules, all sides uh, complete their speaking, and then the opposing side uh, speaks. Huh. All right, I'm not sure that answers my question, but go ahead and call the next speaker, Madam Clerk. The next two speakers, sir, are speaking in opposition. The first one is Mr. Michael Starling. Mr. Michael Starling. The second speaker is Miss Tracy Starling. <coughs> Officer, would you check the hallway for me outside, please? So my the, the final speaker would be Mr. Joe Riddle. Mr. Riddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I don't need to say a lot. I think it, uh, everybody's done a good job speaking in front of me. Um, but I do want to say this, that uh, in the Rileys, of course, had, had stated earlier that They've owned this property since 1939, which puts them way ahead of the schools and way ahead of most all the development out, uh, Lakewood Fisher. Uh, my family got involved in about 1974 in a development that is now called Gates 4. It was Iron Gate, built in about 1966. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, I ran the club for a couple of years um, when I got out of college. Uh, and uh, lived there for quite a while and uh, you know, grew up to love the place. And uh, it, uh, it means a lot to me uh, to be able to do a nice development. And uh, there I would you know, like to really do a nice development that would complement Gates 4. I do not want to stump my toe down the street from uh, my father's uh, pride and joy. So uh, that's the main thing I wanted to say. The other thing, too, is that uh, you know the, the city council and the staff worked really hard uh, for a long time with some outside help to develop uh, our unified development ordinance, which uh, I'm not real sure how many pages there are there, but I can tell you this, uh, a lot of the reason that, that y'all developed the UDO was to protect neighborhoods. And uh, I think you've got uh, uh, an ordinance that does that, and uh, we've already got to follow that ordinance, which, uh, can be pretty arduous trying to follow it and uh, obey it. And so I think you, you worked hard to get that, uh, that tool there for you, and I think it'll do the job. So I appreciate your, uh, your vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you. May we have no further speakers? Close the public hearing. Go to council. Mayor Pro Tem Davey. I just wanted to give staff an opportunity. I think um, Mr. Harmon or Scott seemed like they had some questions based on the presentation so far. Um, as far as yes. just in general or? Do you have questions? Oh, as about far as, oh, the, uh, the multimodal. Um, of course, the when staff put comments in about uh, following that multimodal plan, um, those, you know, the roundabout, things of that nature, those would be DOT projects. All we are talking about is the things that would occur on the applicant's property. Um, that's, you know, that really goes without saying. We don't make applicants do improvements on other people's properties. Um, so I'm not, not sure where the confusion in that part really lies, but 
you know, obviously something like a roundabout on property they don't own, uh, doing uh, sidewalks and stuff on the other sides of the street really has nothing to do with this project. So what specifically do are, are you is staff requiring? Pull that picture of the. Uh, Just to make it clear to the applicant. Right, which one? The street. Oh, there you go. All right, um, Ms. Davy, I think the this picture shows what we were after. Uh, this is would be an internal uh, access way on the applicant's property. This would be our thought that something like this would be what would be constructed, uh, not uh, the uh, massive improvements that they were referring to uh, off-site that Mr. Harmon's already spoken to. Mr. Crisp. Yes, sir. Um, a few things. Mr. Mayor, uh, The issue of a multimodal appearance is not an issue because neither of those roads belongs to the city. They both belong to North Carolina DOT, Fisher Road as well as Lakewood. And so we have no uh, involvement there except on the side where the property is to ensure that there are sidewalks and that they meet our uniform development uh, uh, ordinance. Uh, the other thing I want to point out to you is that property is not suitable for single-family homes. You see those power lines. You cannot build single-family homes under and in a very close proximity to those power lines. You can't do it. And so the quandary here is what does he do with the property? The only thing he's going to be able to build there is under conditional zoning. It's just that simple. Uh, Mr. Riddle has said he will leave that buffer uh, there between that housing development uh, to the left of your screen until such time as he's ready to develop it. But I just think that uh, this is the only solution to it. The issue of the gas station, as Councilor Charleston said, that's subjective. We can each of us sit here and decide what we don't want to see in a rezoning procedure. But the reality of it is, the owners of said property do have some inalienable rights to do things with their property. And that's where we don't want to cross the line to begin to dictate. When we do that, then I'm going to tell you what side of the bedroom you got to put your bed on. You with me? And so we need to be very cautious there. I just want to get that in there and I would like to make a motion so we can get it on and then go from there with discussion if possible. I can't stop you from making a motion, Mr. Crisp. We do have some other speakers, though, if you'd like to hear from them first. All right, sir. Thank you. Mr. Colvin. Uh, I guess my question would be for, uh, I guess, the counsel of Mr. Riddle or, or either Mr. Riddle maybe. Uh, I think Mr. Player said a couple of things in, in here that I just needed to clear up a little bit. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Real, thank you and appreciate what you do for the community. Uh, I think Mr. Player mentioned that one of your concerns um, is that you don't want to be obligated to using the back part for multifamily. Is that right? Is that is that a no, didn't no, you no, say no, it may be it's contingent upon no, what? We've that the back portion is to be left uh, wooded for now, but for the installation of utilities to service the commercial portion, that portion will be zoned multifamily. Um, it will be left wooded, but for the installation of those utilities until such time as Mr. Riddle uh, determines that it's it's feasible to put multifamily back there, and that may be 15 years from now. If I was unclear, I, I apologize, but that was that was what I, I, I meant to say, that uh, it's going to be zoned multifamily. Um, let, let me correct my attorney. All right. It's going to be, if it, it's possibly going to be rezoned to limited commercial conditional zoning. Mm -hmm. What we try to do is, is this track is large, and, and I would agree with council, it was too big to all be commercial. So we've, we're, we're really asking to develop it in a mixed-use type way. So... 
the apartments, the apartment layout was to help buffer. Uh, and this was something that, that staff, you know, likes to see. So we, we, we laid out apartments. Right now, I think apartments are overbuilt in Cumberland County. I don't think there's a need right now for apartments. And that's why I had Mr. Player mention that this could be a 15-year plan. It could be a, a long plan before all the properties used. I mean, it, it, if the market turns, then, then maybe there'll, there'll be some apartments done, you know, within a short period of time. But, <coughs> but uh, that was laid out because it worked for a mixed-use plan. But it will be zoned, potentially rezoned LC. CZ. It's not rezoned multifamily. And, and in my own defense, Mr. Colvin, let me say this. It's difficult at, at this stage to talk, about, to, to talk about things in terms of definites other than the rezoning that, that, that we're trying to achieve here because we don't know what's going on this site other than you know, we don't know how the site's going to be laid out. What we are offering is to have that remain in, in, its, in its current wooded condition. Um, for the foreseeable future and and what was staff's recommendation on that what was that consistent with what you guys were recommending that it that it stay wooded yeah. for indefinite amount of time yeah. okay and the last question i had i think your other uh presenter uh mentioned that you had an issue with the setback with the new setback you know as you know we're trying to uh they're making some very good attempts and 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 a lot of us under our direction of trying to beautify our community with not just the regular asphalt commercial boxes that we have an oversupply of. So some of the ideas they're bringing in with the, the setback differences and, and some of the beautification, is that going to be an issue that presents a problem for you? I think she mentioned something about uh, the setbacks. If the road was widened, and how would that be treated? Or, or what's your concern about that? We'll ask Ms. Epler to address that since she addressed it with the council, if you don't mind. One of, one of staff's comments was that they would like to see the commercial buildings pulled up next to Lakewood and or Fisher Road whenever those frontages are developed. And on streets that are not major thoroughfares, that may be a viable solution. But in this case, Lakewood Drive and Fisher Road both have the very, a very good potential of being thoroughfares. They're already high traveled areas. When the Department of Transportation comes in and decides they need to widen those streets, if our buildings are only sitting 25 feet off the, or 15 feet off the right of way, that means that building is gonna have to be condemned for the Department of Transportation to widen their road if they're already maxed out in their right of way. Yes, sir. Councilmember Wright. I think this is for uh, the city. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to um, actually the design and basically what she's showing us and basically what you're saying as far as what's going there, the roundabout, the road, the uh, sidewalks on each side, mm -hmm. the double roads going. I mean, is it? I mean, I understand what you're saying, but my second question is. Um, where does the school buses come out from the school uh, and where they are they coming out on Fisher Road or are they coming out on on Lakewood um? from, from the elementary school they come out here on Lakewood okay they're going to be coming right out right in front of the business the light. correct and at that at that light and that's why they're I think right now that the buses actually may use this one this uh, exit okay but the uh, the school system has said that you know they would change their bus routing their internal bus routing if they were able to get a stoplight and the school is all right with that oh the school is very much in favor of a stoplight of, of the stoplight yeah okay um and the question is uh, i guess to mr riddle or his people um and i understand the owner is the owner of the land is ready to sell uh, and I really appreciate what you're doing, Mr. Riddle, and the comment you made about your father and that you wanted to do something that he would be proud of. Uh, you, you have a vision of that corner right there. Could you tell me a little bit about what you see there? Well, I mean, that, you know, we route, we have some signs that uh, DOT let us put uh, to guide people. One thing that it was always difficult at Iron Gate, or you might call it Gates 4, is that, you know, Back when I was young, I remember it was seemed like it was way out in the country, you know. 
I mean, just like the Rileys, they were way out in the country. Uh, I remember going out there when I was young, before my father was involved in playing golf at the old Iron Gate, and I think I got lost. It was like going to uh, going to the buffet place down in Lumberbridge, you know, Chasen's. I don't know if y'all ever went to Chasen's, but used to get lost going to there too, you know. It seemed like it was an hour away. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's the front door. I mean, you know, those schools, um, probably the, 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 you know, Gates 4's popularity is, is probably number one because it's secure with, with the guards. Uh, it's private. But number two has got to be the schools. And the schools uh, are, the, are, are the number two or maybe even the number one draw to live in that area. And so certainly I don't want to go at my front door and build something that, I wouldn't be proud of and that everybody wouldn't be proud of and right across the street from those two nice schools I mean those are really high-ranked schools you know it's probably the most desirable district in the county that's why it's grown so much um, but um, I plan to do something architecturally there that would be better than than what you normally see and your UDO I mean I'm, I'm telling you your UDO is loaded with with landscaping and plants I mean I did the Chick-fil-a I was involved in that uh, there's almost too many plants there. At some point, they'll have to pull some. They're going to overgrow each other. I don't know if you've ever done that in your yard, but so when you plant plants that close together and they get larger later, you have to thin them. Uh, your UDO protects you there. I mean, it's going to look good. And, uh, you know, when people drive around Fayetteville and look at the projects that, that don't look good, it's the old ones that they don't have any landscaping or, you know, weren't done nice, but I, I, you know, I don't think your, your new projects in town all look pretty good. I mean, BJ's, that looks good. The Panera Bread on Ramsey, that, that looks good. I mean, I think that, you know, your staff has got you a, a UDO that protects you on that. So we were just asking for you to approve it without additional conditions. There's already 800 pages. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Moan. Oh. Thank you, sir. Uh, for Mr. Harmon, got a question. You know, looking at that southwestern Cumberland and northeastern Hope multimodal congestion plan, I believe that came out of our, our Fayetteville Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. It is from FAM. And so when they look at Lakewood and they look at Fisher, um, I, I would imagine that those projects would be put into our local TIP or the state STIP, you know, the State Transportation Improvement Program, and there will be funding for that, and then there will be a local match. Do we know if this intersection is and those sections of Fisher and Lakewood are e even in the stip or the tip? I don't believe that they are right now. But this, it's a long-range, unfunded. A, yeah, long-range. Uh, this is, you know, what uh, FAMPO has proposed as their long-range vision for that area. Okay. And then, so there is no widening going on right now or, or, no. or funded. And so for the meantime, there would be the um, uh, acceleration or deceleration and turn lanes put in uh, in lieu of a four-lane exactly. divided and road. That, and that's what you NCDOT. see on the, the map that's in front of you. You mm -hmm. see some of these, um, these darker uh, right. gray, almost black areas. Those are your, your decel or turn lanes. Okay. No, that answers my question about the stip and tip and funding. Thank you. All right, Council, seeing no further questions. Mr. Crisp? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council, I move to approve the rezoning of property from SF10 single family residential district to LC uh, slash uh, this limited commercial conditional zoning district located at the southwest corner of the intersection of Fisher and Lakewood Drive, effective this date. Is there a second? I second. Ms. Jensen? Uh, question. Mr. Bone, is that a question related to the motion? That is a question related to the motion. You said reapprove, but then there's um, agreed upon um, stipulations and staff recommended. Um, conditions which conditions are we voting on the conditions my motion is, is inclusive of the conditions from zoning well we just to clarify with the conditional zoning 
uh, only the conditions that the applicant is willing to put forward yes. are the only ones that uh, that can be included. So, and, and if you're presented to zoning, right? They are presented to zoning. Uh, so, what your motion at this point would have to be is uh, that it's based on those conditions. Whoops, let's see here. Uh, these conditions, uh, these three that have been submitted by the applicant. Then may I restate the motion, Mr. Mayor? Uh, then I, I move uh, to approve the rezoning of property from SF10 single family residential district to limited commercial slash conditional zoning located at the southwest corner of the intersection of Fisher Road and Lakewood Drive uh, with the conditions approved uh, as stated by the applicant conditions one through three effective this date does that answer your question sir yes thank you very good any further questions related to the motion i second okay that meets your second okay further questions seeing none council i'll ask for your vote please Madam Clerk, that is an eight to two with council members Colvin and Hurst voting against. Thank you. Go to item 9.04, which is the rezoning of property from an MR5 or mixed residential to an NC, which is a neighborhood commercial uh, location of Locust Street. Mr. Harmon. Yes, Mr. Mayor. This property is located at 715 Locust. I'll give you an idea of where this property is. Uh, you have Southeastern Boulevard uh, on the south side of, uh, just south of Russell Street. Uh, Locust Street uh, turns off of Southeastern Boulevard. Um, and this property is basically located in between. Uh, you've got commercial zoning uh, on the property beside of it. And, the, and half of the property behind it. Then to the, the eastern side, you have residential beside of it and half residential behind it. And then you have uh, industrial zoning uh, on the south side of the street here. Um, as you can see again, uh, almost everything along Southeastern Boulevard, as you know, is uh, heavily commercialized. Uh, and then, <clears throat> low density residential for the main part uh, back here uh, along King Street and Locust and Chestnut in that area. Um, this does fall into our downtown <coughs> district as far as our land use plan goes. Our downtown district uh, allows for a, a wide variety of uses uh, as you would have in, in downtowns. Um, so everything from residential to industrial is recommended at, in, at times. Uh, just a few photos of the property. This is the property itself, uh, heavily wooded at the moment. Uh, this is the industrial warehouse to the south. This is the uh, tobacco shop commercial area uh, to the east, I mean to the west. And this is the, uh, the two residential properties uh, to the west that back up, uh, that back up to the uh, side of this project. Um, you can kind of see a little storage building behind one of the homes here. That's kind of the, the back property line. So a lot of these trees on back here are part of the property in question. Um, the Zoning Commission actually denied this project as coming to you on appeal. Um, they cited the proximity to residential properties uh, and that uh, there were some uses, especially restaurants in the neighborhood commercial district that uh, could have alcohol sales that they felt was not a good fit for the neighborhood. Um, city staff, however, had recommended approval of the zoning. Uh, that's based on uh, uh, in the UDO and NC district uh, is one of our districts that serves as a buffer area between uh, generally residential and, and heavier commercial districts. 
Uh, and in this case, it's a buffer between three different types of hit from heavy commercial to industrial to residential. Uh, with heavy commercial industrial properties uh, around this, <clears throat> and because of its size, it's uh, not real viable for a residential lot. Uh, and then uh, our 2030 growth plan calls for uh, new development in areas where the infrastructure is already in place. Any questions of staff before we open your public hearing? Mayor, we have three speakers, one speaking in favor and two in opposition. The first speaker in favor is Mr. R Rani Nimux. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Rani Nimux. I reside at 2808 Sky Drive here in Fayetteville, and I'm one of the property owners here. I promise to be very brief. Um, I would like to redirect you to the maps that Mr. Harmon uh, discussed with you and so that you will realize that the properties to the north, south, east, and west of this lot are predominantly uh, heavy industrial and heavy commercial properties. There are 13 houses on South King Street which are the closest residential units to this property. The two houses that abut this property were built in 1920. Of the 13 houses on South King Street, three of them are already zoned heavy industrial. Uh, they were built between 1920 and 1950. So I submit to you that the market has determined that there is not a market for residential use when nothing has been built in that immediate area for residential in the last 65 years. Um, when we had a contract to sell this property uh, for a use that required outside storage, I met with Mr. Harmon to try to be in compliance with the UDO and with the land use plan. Um, and we determined that uh, heavy industrial would be required or an industrial zoning would be required in order to uh, have our buyer uh, meet his needs for this property. So we, we voided that contract and uh, in meeting with Mr. Harmon we determined that the, the, the least objectionable zoning would be neighborhood commercial. So that's what we have applied for. Um, I would remind you that the staff recommended approval of this zoning request. It does uh, fall in line with the UDO and the land use plan. And for that reason, we would like to get a zoning that would make it marketable. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Mayor, our next speaker is Miss Rebecca Arrington. Good evening. Mayor and council members. Um, my name is Rebecca Arrington and I reside at 4421 Atlantic Avenue, but I um, own properties at those two houses that you saw, plus the lot beside of it and a house across the street. So 308, 311, 314, and 316. This land has been in my family since 1901. Um, and yes, we do have to concede that it, this area is in transition, but it, they, we're, we're still there. Um, and we ask that you um, protect our right to still live there. I still have family members that, that reside there. Um, our main objection to um, the restaurant or small neighborhood is um, we and council woman Davey can concede to this. We fought um, long and hard with the city of Fayetteville and the police department and spent a lot of tax dollars with upscales, which upscales obtained their um, permit to open up where the old Waffle House was saying that they were a restaurant. And just because it's a restaurant doesn't mean that it's going to be all food. And if anybody remembers upscales, it had murders and 
shootings and stuff there all the time and the police were there. There were calls for service that were too numerous to mention. We don't want another upscales. We can't afford another upscales. The city doesn't need another upscales in their budget. Um, we are not opposed to commerce. We have lived with Union Corrugating, uh, Finch Oil Company, and currently we have a brand new, the building that you saw that looked really bad with the uh, industrial can there is now beautiful. It has a nice um, asphalt parking lot and it's going to be a Napa um, auto parts uh, citywide distribution. And, and you know, we're okay, with, we're okay with commerce, but we're not okay. And that would be directly across from there. That wooded lot is directly across from there. And I just don't think that we need to, to, to open up that door. I think if there were a small business that wanted to go in there, anything that didn't sell al alcohol or encourage people to go and party, that's also a very small lot. If they put um, a berm, it's not gonna leave a whole lot of place there for them to have to make a business. So I ask that you um, do not approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, our final speaker is Mr. Mike Thompson. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Mike Thompson. I live at 7273 Wood Drive. I own property at 304 South King Street. Um, basically, I will echo a lot of what Ms. Arrington said. The major concerns are the prox and the zoning commission's um, concerns as well. The proximity to the two homes that are to the east of the property, it is just a few feet, so any type of business that generates uh, is allowed will be detrimental to the folks who live in, in those two homes, and that is their home. And also just the, the proximity, and then, of course, the current zoning that is proposed does allow for alcohol sales, which can't guarantee anything, but um, it does open a door. It does open a door which we have seen a history in the neighborhood of being abused and causing crime in the community. Uh, I would like to point out that while the homes may be older, there has been money spent in maintaining the homes over the years or else they wouldn't be there at all. Uh, I would like to also po point out that the Zoning Commission voted unanimously because of the concerns <laughs> of the residents of the community whose land does butt up against the property, voted unanimously against this rezoning. Uh, again, the, com the homeowners are not against business in the area, but do have um, serious concerns based on the history of what has happened in the area. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have no further speakers. Close the public hearing. Mr. Moan. Is this appropriate time to um, ask staff for the speakers a question? Absolutely, sir. Okay, um, this would, you know, both for staff and the applicant, would, given the, the concern for alcohol sales, tobacco shop type things, can we, would, is it possible to convert this to a conditional zoning where the applicant and, a, and the parties agree that it could be a neighborhood commercial minus and you say like anything that sells alcohol or you, you, you eliminate some things that would possibly make them. Uh, we can do that. We can't do it at this meeting. Okay. Um, the council would have to vote to send this item back to the zoning commission as a conditional zoning uh, and then have the uh, zoning commission rehear it. Um, but that certainly is uh, something that could be done. I think that I won't speak for the applicant, but I think that may be something that he would be willing to do as well. Yeah, absolutely. I would be uh, I would be agreeable to no alcohol sales on this property. Okay, and then for the the family members, it, you know, I would ask them if if that would be something they would be willing to discuss with. This would be the time. You know, uh, and that way, you go through everything that's in the neighborhood commercial. You know what's available in there, and you could potentially agree to eliminate things that you do not want so it's still neighborhood commercial but it's not you know going to contain the, the fears you have as, as family members would, would that be something you'd be willing to have this come back 
think so. Thank you, all parties involved, staff. Mayor Pro Tem Davy. Well, with that, thank you, Councilmember Moan, for that, for clarifying that information. I would like to move um, that nine. Point oh four gets sent back to staff um, for further review and looking at a possible um, conditions added to this rezoning. Okay. All right, there's a first and a second kind of snuck up on me. Mr. Chris, okay. you had your light pulled. Did you want to discuss Yes, sir. I, I, I'm, I'm sat satisfied with the motion, but I do have a question on okay. the discussion. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, Ms. Harmon, if we do... <clears throat> Send this back. Does the applicant have to pay any additional funds? Uh, typically, if it's sent back uh, by council, we have not uh, made them do that in the past. In, in, my point here is, in so much as both parties are agreeable to it going back, I think the only real concern is not a commercial establishment, but one but to make sure that there's no alcohol uh, there. I don't, I don't think we ought to penalize the applicant by requiring him, him to pay additional funds. That's my concern, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, did you want to consider that, yeah. Mayor Pro Tem? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. McDougal. Yeah, are we sending it back to staff or are we sending it back to the Zoning Commission Zoning. itself? Back to yeah, that, that might need to be clarified just a little bit because I think in your motion you said staff, but right. it just needs to be said as zoning commission. And back to the zoning commission. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to push that, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> can we, um, Mr. Mayor? Go ahead, Mr. Arp. Can, can we also add to that, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, that the, uh, just for clarification, that the current application fee that's be, been paid will suffice and no additional fees will be required? No additional fees are required. Is that okay with the second? Very good. Okay. Further discussion, Council? I'll ask for your vote, please. Okay. Sorry, that's unanimous, Madam Clerk. Council, I'd like to take a five-minute break at this point, if we can do that, please. We get in there.
Council item 9.05 is the amendment to the uh, city charter chapter. Is that city charter? Uh, yes. Amendment to the city charter chapter 30 to create a new overlay district. Uh, Scott Thank Shuford. you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this, this is a text amendment. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, it's to create an, a new overlay district that we've titled uh, Suburban Activity Center Overlay, or SACO. And uh, as y'all recall, this is part of our redevelopment toolbox that we've been talking about for the last year or so. Uh, this particular ordinance was an outgrowth of the Ramsey Corridor studies. And um, uh, the idea is to create these centers of activity that are going to uh, uh, help with the redevelopment of our ex the existing corridors and provide some catalyst for future development that will occur in that vicinity. Um, here's a, a, a drawing of what it perhaps could look like in this particular instance. We've used this uh, and there's a blow up, but um, I think I've got some better ones here that more are more reflective of exactly what we're talking talking about here's a, a better picture with the uh, the wide sidewalk sort of a um, uh, an urban type center that could occur along our corridors here's an example from uh, from another community of exactly what we're talking about um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you've heard it before uh, uh, there are a variety of things in here that are incentives that will really help um, move these things forward um, we deal with uh, uh, some flexibility about open space and parkland. It's approved as part of a master plan. Uh, higher densities allowed, and uh, uh, in general, with the buildings pushed up closer to the street, there's reduction in the landscaping. Um, so here's a, a, a drawing that shows the interior street uh, layouts that are part of the package and uh, um, how it, it could be configured. Um, but perhaps this is picture is a, a better one. If you take a look at this uh, series of, um, of drawings and, and look at the left one first, you'll see sort of an existing situation that's common to our uh, corridors throughout Fayetteville. Uh, large retail center in the back, uh, out parcels in the front. And then you can see that uh, this offers an opportunity for redeveloping of these properties by adding new buildings, perhaps these are office buildings that are added here in the um, interior and the one along the main road. And then later on, all the out parcels are gone and a more urban uh, configuration is created. So that's the uh, sort of the thought process behind this, uh, this particular district. Um, but the Planning Commission and staff recommend that you uh, uh, approve this and um, um, I'm here to answer any questions and also to remind you that uh, this is a public hearing, although no one has signed up. Thank you, Mr. Shuford. We'll open and close the public hearing. Council, questions for staff? Mr. McDougall. Uh, no questions, Mr. Mayor. I make a motion of approval. Mr. McDougall, seconded by Mr. Wright. Discussion, council on the motion. Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote, please. Madam Clerk, that's unanimous. Nine point zero six amendment to city code chapter thirty dash three to create a new regional activity center overlay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a uh, not qu quite the same thing as the Suburban Activity Center, but uh, it has some of the characteristics of it. it certainly, you can have a master plan uh, that would uh, look similar to that. But again, it's uh, an opportunity to, um, to promote redevelopment uh, as well as new development. And um, uh, again, if you think about uh, the Glensford Road area, the mall area, um, that area has, has got a, a, an awful lot of really high-end type of uses, and the Regional Activity Center could give us an opportunity to further limit the uses that might go into that area to help support that. And um, uh, so uh, there will be uh, the potential for you to sort of uh, 
uh, address use issues, development characteristics, and uh, uh, have standards that support uh, uh, the regional activity center uh, activities uh, and uses. Again, both of these ordinances are ones that uh, we um, uh, will certainly involve the public uh, in, in it before they're applied in any location, obviously. And um, uh, the suburban one will probably only be applied when you have a uh, someone wanting to do it. But uh, uh, I can see the regional activity center perhaps being unilaterally applied by city council for the purposes of protecting the, uh, uh, the characteristics of the area. Uh, so both Planning Commission and staff recommend that uh, we approve this uh, as I presented it here tonight. Did you say this was going to be used to further limit? Well, let me, let me give you an example, Mayor. Uh, again, I used the Glensford Road area. Um, that area is zoned community commercial. Uh, that allows a lot of quasi-industrial type of uses, many warehouses, um, uh, auto repair, all sorts of other uses like that. And so perhaps in that area, we get with the property owners and say, um, your area is primarily a restaurant and retail area that has certain characteristics. Uh, perhaps it would be a good idea not to have some of these uses allowed in this area. Um, also, we could talk to them about uh, what other um, services they might want in the general vicinity to uh, to help support them and uh, it could create an opportunity for a, a, a planning uh, session with the the property owners to see which direction they want to go uh, so we, we think it's a, a worthy tool to have in your uh, your toolbox and we think it could help facilitate some of your uh, your goals and uh, objectives Thank you, Mr. Shuford. Madam Clerk. No, we have no speakers for this item. We'll open and close the hearing. Council. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve. Um, Second. This item. <laughs> yes, Mr. Wright, seconded by Mr. McDougal. Council, is there a discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for your vote, please. Madam Clerk, that is nine to one with the mayor voting against. Items of other business. Mr. Colvin. Um, yeah, Mr. Colvin. Mr. Mayor, I want to uh, make a motion to reconsider item 8.024, the uninhabitable structured demolitions that we discussed earlier. Um, there was... Uh, particular uh, couple that had signed up for uh, public hearing that did not get an opportunity to speak. And uh, since we had reconsidered uh, one of the properties, I wanted to make sure we could see if we could amend that to, to rehear that, uh, that entire. I second that motion. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so may you first would have a motion to reconsider. You would vote on the reconsideration and then move to the substantive motion. Thank you. And we do have a motion and a second by Council Member Wright for reconsideration of item 8.024. Call for the question, Mr. Mayor. Hang on. Madam Attorney, do we have to reconsider all of consent to do that since that was passed in consent? Okay. Okay. And that's what the motion was. So, okay, we're fine. We have an appropriate first and second. Um, is there discussion? Seeing none. Council, I'll ask for your vote for consid uh, reconsideration. reconsideration of the item. Madam Clerk, Madam Attorney, that is nine to one. Councilmember McDougal voting against. All right, Mr. Colvin. Mr. 
Mr. Mayor, if I may, since I made the original motion to add that to the mm -hmm. consent agenda, I, I would move that for item 8.24, uh, that based on the previous motion that we add 415 Cedric Street and 439 Cedric Street, along with 511 Haddock Street, to be items for discussion at our November 3rd work session. Second. Motion by Mr. Arp, seconded by Mr. Colvin. Council. Seeing no discussion, I'll ask for your vote, please. <coughs> That's unanimous, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Mr. Voorhees, item 10.01 is National League of Cities uh, business meeting voting delegate. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's traditional um, that any uh, jurisdictions that, that's represented at the National League of Cities uh, consider one of their members to be appointed as the voting delegate for the purposes of any business meeting that may be conducted. So I'd advise council to uh, consider the, among those attending the National League of Cities meeting to appoint uh, somebody uh, who's attending to be that voting delegate. Do you have a list of who's attending, Mr. Voorhees? No. I believe council has that. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. I move that we nominate Councilmember Mitch Colvin as a voting delegate for the National League of Cities annual business meeting. Second. Se Made by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Mr. Hurst. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, Council, I'll ask for your vote. That's unanimous, Madam Clerk. You're pretty sad for you. Vote against yourself. <laughs> Item 10.02 is moved to consent. I heard Rebecca. And 10.03 uh, is strategic <laughs> performance Yeah, shouldn't that report? be an alternate also, Mr. Mayor? Just in case Mr. Colvin doesn't make it. Um, yeah. <laughs> certainly, we'll be happy to do that yeah, if did, you'd like to nominate it. somebody. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Paul, McDougal? Paul, Paul. Oh, no, no. Uh, right. Councilmember Wright. I nominate Councilmember Wright. I'm not, I make a motion. That, uh, Second. 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 Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, hearing none, Council, I'll ask for your vote. All right. So if Chalmers pushes Colvin, Colvin down the steps, <laughs> right, you got it. Congratulations, Mr. Wright. <coughs> That's unanimous, Madam Clerk. Mr. Voorhees. Ten Thank you, Mr. Zero. Mayor and Council members. Uh, item 10.03 will be presented uh, by Ms. Rebecca Rogers Carter. I would note that. Um, uh, assistant manager Reinstein instructed me that he has told her, given the late hour, to restrict her comments to 40, no more than 45 minutes. So, I, I can assure you, Mr. Manager, <laughs> it will be you and him to yeah. approve. <laughs> no, I, I won't either, sir. <laughs> so, uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I'll make this as brief as possible. Um, the agenda item 10.03 reviews the strategic priorities set forth in the fiscal year 2014 plan and reports progress made toward each priority. As you know, the strategic plan sets the direction and the goals of the City of Fayetteville and helps guide the actions of City Council and staff. We also worked um, to narrow down our strategic plan priorities in fiscal year 2014. And most importantly, we began to track um, our performance. Strategic planning is the process that assists council as representatives of our community to plan for our future. Um, a strategic plan is the blueprint for opera operationalizing an organizational vision. Now that's a mouthful. Um, but in other words, how do we make our vision a reality? And as the city of Fayetteville continues to grow and thrive, the city council looks to chart that course with the strategic plan. This model aligns uh, city programs and spending with your long-term goals and your critical needs. 
Um, and as you can see from this graphic, the strategic plan in the burgundy box um, t at the very top, that feeds into uh, the budget process and provides direction. Um, it prioritizes your services and your infrastructure needs. It's very important. And basically, planning is about analysis, and strategy really is about synthesis. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, here, but this, um, I did want to mention that the city manager's office has the overall responsibility to ensure that the strategic plan is implemented. Our strategic plan has five main elements. You all have um, seen this before, the vision, the mission, the core values, the goals. Um, and the goals this year have objective statements and performance measures, and we have a one-year action plan. Um, the report that you have in your materials this evening and on your dais goes into further detail of those um, elements. The green box I do want to mention in this, um, in this cycle uh, represents the budget process. Um, this past budget cycle, we successfully and sometimes painfully transitioned into program budgeting. Uh, city staff worked to develop the program inventory of 69 citywide programs and financially map them for the budget process. Without defining those um, programs, it really is impossible to identify those objectives, um, what we're actually trying to achieve, and performance measures, um, how well we are uh, moving in that direction. Um, and then we're going to move into the operational um, performance measurement. The transition to the program budgeting and performance measurement was a change management process here at the city. We developed a team structure to build that accountability, and we implemented a communication and a training plan. We called this effort the PRIDE program, meaning that we'll focus on program performance, results, and integration into our organizational culture. I placed a copy of our PRIDE program um, uh, I, I, think, I think we call it our PRIDE program booklet. Um, it has our standards and operating procedures, and that's just for your reference, so you can um, take that back with you and uh, let me know if you have any questions about it. Uh, more than 500 performance measures uh, were identified and aligned to the city's overall strategic plan. Uh, goal champions, goal teams, data analytic teams were formed to build that foundation uh, the systems to collect, analyze, measure, and evaluate our performance. So everyone here played a critical role, and I wanted to make sure that I mentioned tonight um, that I'd like to actually recognize this pride team. The city manager's office appointed um, the goal champions for each of the six city strategic goals. These goal champions have met continuously since June and have formed goal teams to refine the programs, performance measures, and work on those strategic initiatives. They serve as the lead and point of contact and for reporting in all aspects, really, of the assigned goal. And I'd like to recognize these organizational leaders for their efforts to implement that city strategic plan. We've got for uh, goal one, Ben Major, the fire chief. Goal two, Ms. Rochelle Smaltoni, our deputy city manager. Um, goal three, Rusty Thompson, ENI director. Goal four, Kelly Blazy, transit assistant director. Goal five, Dwayne Campbell, chief information officer. And goal six, Tracy Davis, corporate communications director. I wanted to also share with you um, this other facet. We developed a data analytics team comprised of the best analytical minds in the city. Um, the core membership we held at 10, just to keep it um, at a reasonable level. They, but they do represent a cross-section of all city departments. Um, anyone and everyone, though, with any responsibility or interest in data um, analytics or data management is welcome to these meetings, and we do see them come and go. The city manager um, formally approved the data analytic team charter and the first round of their recommended uh, performance measurement standards. And tonight, I would like to introduce that team. Uh, they really should be recognized for their extraordinary work. This is above and beyond their duties here at the city. Um, and uh, again, they've recommended already performance measurement standards that were approved by the city manager. They uh, work on best practices for performance measurement. Um, and they've also assisted some of the goal teams in developing their performance measures. And finally, they're preparing for the first performance measurement audit 
Um, and so tonight, um, I, I think he's the sole man left standing. <laughs> I would like to recognize Chris if he'll take if he'll stand up. This is Mr. Chris McMillan. Um, he facilitates the data analytics team, the DAT, um, and he keeps this team moving forward. Uh, we really appreciate his leadership. Um, he's here tonight representing the DAT. I think they all have wandered off. Um, but the other team members are listed on your screen. We have Greg Kaysen, Mike Hill, Michelle Hare, Sherry Leggins, Teresa Faircloth, Luis Colazzo, Keisha Kinsley, and Anthony Kelly. Great set of people uh, moving this uh, city forward in this, in this particular area. So as you could see, we are deliberately moving from a trust us city government into um, one that it's dedicated to transparency and accountability. Not only do we just need the facts, ma'am, we need to also tell our story. So we're focusing on what uh, measuring what matters and driving home really the importance of that quality data set and good data management. That has to come first. So much of our time lately has been spent on defining data, those, those data attributes, and working with departments and understanding what their processes are. And we are actually still building that systematic approach to all of that um, that will eventually let us benchmark our, and evaluate our successes with specific performance targets. And I know Councilmember Art, we always talk about that, specific performance targets. We're not quite there yet, but this particular report moves us a little one step forward. Um, so at this point, I had transitioned into the 2014 report. Um, specifically, I'm gonna go through fairly quickly. You all have had an opportunity to review the report. I'm not gonna mention every detail in it because it's 50 pages long. Um, but there are some accomplishments, I think, that need to be recognized, but more importantly, and um, we need to recognize where we haven't actually hit the mark. Um, the report begins with an overview of our strategic planning process. Um, remember that this is the 2014 strategic plan um, that was developed actually in February 13. So this report highlights that important work that we did in incorporating uh, the input from citizens and staff with the, um, the, the surveys that we did. Um, it also speaks to the work that um, we, we did in, in um, narrowing down those priorities so that we can really focus on the work that we're doing. We're gearing up actually for another employee survey. I wanted to let you know that will be coming out in November and uh, that information uh, will come to you through your strategic planning efforts. The report also outlines the strategic planning um, framework for fiscal year 2014. Um, you may have noticed that in the, in the report, the actual adopting council was um, pictured in the report. I wanted to just uh, mention that um, we certainly didn't want to misrepresent the different councils and their strategic planning framework. So, so that one um, focuses on the vision and the mission and the, the core values and the goals that they set. So that's why that happened. Um, but I will say that the strategic planning elements and the work that you all are doing now even will be represented in the report coming in January. So we will transition um, that over in, into fiscal year 15. Um, the city's mission um, hasn't changed very much. It just uh, really identifies for the city of Fayetteville our role in pursuing the community's vision. The core values, um, these are uh, values of the city of Fayetteville and they're the defining characteristics of how we operate. Um, and this particular performance report follows what I call a cascading methodology of performance reporting and that is really gauging our performance through the achievements in each of the city's strategic goal areas. So um, council sets the six goals which outline the path um, that we need to take in order to reach the community's vision. And for each goal, we've identified targets for action and performance measures. Now, if you remember at the beginning of fiscal year 14, Fayetteville was one of the very few, if not the only, I think it was the only large municipality without any performance management system in place at all. So we've come uh, quite a long way. I mean, it's really your um, council's focused uh, on accountability and transparency that really allowed us to do that. So I wanna thank you for that. Tracking and trending and benchmarking performance measures results, this is gonna tell us how effective and efficient that we are being, and this report moves us a little bit closer. Um, in fiscal year 14, City Council added the goal safe and secure community, um, and it was really focused on building that safe and secure community. 
And uh, under this goal, the report that you have in front of you includes police and fire performance results. And I want you to mention this, that they are from calendar year 13. Um, and it also includes um, specific updates on your strategic initiatives. Um, the reason I mentioned that police and fire um, numbers are calendar year um, is because that they report those that data um, for accreditation purposes and to the public um, and to outside agencies. And as a team, we kind of made that decision that we were going to follow suit. And as time goes on, you'll see as trending, we're able to build that data set and trending. That six-month lag isn't going to matter a whole lot. Um, frankly, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the initiatives that you put into place now really won't have an impact on performance in a month or two anyway. So um, just so that we can be consistent with their reporting, we're going to use that. But this um, report also includes a lot of other performance measures, um, crime and clearance rates, police and fire response times, public safety staffing levels, citizen results surveys. It also includes some significant advancements in your targets for action. Um, one of them was the sector lieutenant models. Another one um, was uh, when the police uh, department produced and launched their Educating kids, kids About Gun Violence program. That continues as a strategic initiative for your fiscal year 15. Um, it's a great program. It's been heralded as a, as a success. Um, I've actually seen the video, and it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and an update, I also do want to mention that, um, that one of – this council's top five priorities is actually um, additional resources for the police department. So you will see that flow over to your next report. Okay. Hey, Rebecca, before, can you go back to that slide, please? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's late, I know, but I'm, I am going to ask this question. Yes. Um, on the targeted, targets for action identified, one of those targets was enhanced gang reduction and prevention strategies. And then we have our performance measurements identified beneath that. What would it take to get the, the fast student activity pass as one of the targeted performance measures that we're measuring to make sure we're implementing that? I, it, it wouldn't take anything but you, you um, suggesting it. And then we were going to take suggest it right back. That. I, I would suggest that because like, when the council passed that, the intent was to offer – alternative activities for our high school uh, you know, students who wanted to participate in athletics or band or after school activities that couldn't participate because they had transportation issues. Right. And now we're, we're nearly six months down the road and we still don't have mm -hmm. you know, any real uh, effect with that. And I, I'd like to see that be a targeted measure. Okay, and, and can you repeat that, sir, so I can- It's the it. FAST student activity pass, if I think is the correct term. And, and the PASS system allows these students to ride the bus after school if they're an identified student who's participating in an extracurricular activity at no cost. I believe we took action on that maybe May or June. I think I was in the room when you did. I, re I recall that discussion. Um, but that is a great point. Um, and as we refine these measures, um, we are still in goal teams, I'm still refining the measures, I'm still coming up with uh, ways to align these measures with your strategic planning goals. And um, I appreciate um, that. I appreciate your thoughts on that. Yes. Mr. McDougal. Yeah, I think um, part of the problem, as I recall it, is they're trying to eliminate a problem before the problem <laughs> ever starts. And I think, I think really they may be moving in the wrong direction. In other words, um, uh, I think they're trying to prevent an unauthorized user of the past, but they need to go in on the issue of the past. I agree with you. And, and recognize that as a problem that they need to somehow another fix, uh, but not just not issue the past. Go ahead on and issue it and then start working at it because you know it's going to be a problem that, you know, one student may pass it off to another student, but, you know, you know work at fixing that. Yeah, and it may be, you know, this this technology of fingerprint or eye print is so, you know, it may be something that we need to do. So. Not to add the performance measure. Okay, thank you. No. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. So the second goal, we'll move on to the second goal, is um, diverse and viable economy. Um, this is where the city is fostering economic health and vitality for our community by creating jobs and supporting strategic industry 
Um, this report in front of you includes performance measures such as the estimated tax base, the median wage for Fayetteville, unemployment comparison, um, and jobs created. We also included statistics from your community development department. Um, the target for action under this goal is to implement local business initiatives. You have um, an update in your report regarding those uh, particular enhancements. Um, the establishment of the um, Economic Development Task Force was tabled um, until further direction by Council. However, staff's been focused on the creation of the Economic and Business Development Department, which will continue as your top five, uh, one of your top five pro uh, policy priorities in fiscal year 15. So you'll be receiving um, an update on that. Okay, so goal three, moving on to goal three. Um, the third goal of the city is to be a well-designed city with high quality infrastructure. And here we've really focused on the quality of our built environment. Performance measures such as the quality of streets index, building inspections, and code violations are included in the report. We also provided an update of uh, the RAMP program, which is a tool for improving the quality of life and revitalizing your deteriorating neighborhoods. Tonight you heard from Mr. Um, Chet Omi, our RAMP chair, about that program. Additionally, a target for action under this goal was to increase um, street maintenance funding and shorten the time for resurfacing. So you're gonna notice a red indicator here. The city is currently operating still under the 36 year cycle. No additional funded, uh, funding was provided in 14. And in fact, the 15 budget included a reduction in maintenance and resurfacing funding. But under the Gateway Initiative, uh, litter crews were reinstated and the outdoor adoption program was adopted in 14 and is underway. And I know that some of you are working um, in that area as well, and that initiative will, I'm sure, flow over to the next, um, to the next strategic plan report. So the fourth goal of the city is to be a highly desirable place to live, work, and recreate. This goal ensures that the city promotes a good quality of life for residents and visitors. Uh, we've included performance measures that are relevant for this goal, such as park and recreation program participation levels, results um, from the airport customer survey, the transit NTD report, performance statistics, the litter index, and measures for residential collection and the recycling program. The targets for action under this goal were to revisit the funding plan for parks and recreation and to develop that traffic flow improvement strategy. So you're gonna notice the um, red light indicator on the park and recreation. Um, and then over the fiscal year, staff assessed the traffic flow. And I know that you have heard from them in March. Um, they've done some work with NCDOT and uh, built some strategies around that. Okay, so goal five, uh, city council recognizes that when leaders are moving in the same direction, the organization has the capacity to complete its directives and we all get there faster. To that end, we've included the city's um, retention rate, uh, per capita tax burden, and the city's bond rating, among other performance measures. We've also pro provided an update on the city's transition to program budgeting and performance measurement, and the development of the new city um, appreciation and recognition, and recognition program called the Core Value Awards. Our IT department's been very busy implementing uh, several large IT initiatives, and moving into fiscal year 15, the top policy priority is going to be to implement a citywide customer service initiative, which is really underway now. Um, finally, um, we're gonna take a look at goal six, which is citizen engagement and partnerships. There's been quite a lot of progress in this goal area. Staff launched the city's first government access channel and continues to build the programming and content. The city launched the FayettevilleOutfront.com, which is that civic engagement piece on the website. Uh, the communication plan is under review. It's, it's completed and under view, review with the city manager. Um, developing and maintaining partnerships was another TFA, a target for action, and uh, we completed that with the um, community conversations event. So um, I guess in closing, I would just say that um, prior to the city council retreat, I will be preparing another strategic plan report for your review, and that's going to be based mostly on your strategic initiatives um, within that plan. Uh, we won't do a whole nother full set of actual performance numbers because we're gonna be planning 
for the budget document, those estimated 15 and 16 numbers. I did want to mention that at the end of the strategic planning development process last year, staff surveyed council um, to try to identify ways that we can um, help your retreat be more effective. Um, council, the survey results indicated that count, the council input sessions and the priority exercises were some of the top rated <coughs> sessions. Um, also, council gave the direction that the strategic plan would be a two-year plan, um, meaning that revisions to the vision, the mission, the core values, and the goals would be revisited every two years based on that election cycle. Um, so this year, we're going to be focused on the one-day retreat, and that's February 13th, so save the date. And you'll be focused on uh, performance, objectives, and priorities, and resourcing. And with that, that concludes my um, presentation. And I'd ask if there are any questions, I'd be happy to attempt to answer them. <laughs> Mr. Wright. Uh, yes, Rebecca, you made a, a mention during your uh, analysis that you uh, <coughs> put together some of the best minds in Fayetteville. And I noticed that you were on the top of the list that <laughs> saying that you had. <laughs> I'm not part of the 10. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ms. Rogers Carter. Any other uh, discussion or questions? Mr. Mayor, I was just going to move that we accept the report as presented. Second. And if I could just thank uh, Rebecca and Chris here, there's just been a tremendous amount of, of work here to, to build this program from the ground up. Uh, it's been uh, great to watch, and you just sort of let them run, and their creative juices and energy has been great to watch. So I hope you'll appreciate that growing up over the next uh, few months and seeing those results. Great reports. Mr. Crisp. Mr. Carter, I just want to tell you, this is, in my estimation, your best one yet. Thank you. Okay. You say that every time. Well, no. <laughs> well, but no, this one really is. Feel terrific, well, you're getting though. better every time, but this is very comprehensive. It shows the green lights, the red lights, the caution lights on where we are. Very comprehensive report. That's uh, an awful lot of work went into this, and we appreciate it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's your best one ever. Thank you. Ever. I'll say that next year, too. <laughs> Mr. McDougall. Even I'm beginning to understand. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Motion to break. <laughs> we would Council, ask that you move to, to um, accept the report. All right. Council. Here's Mr. One. Colvin, is there a second? Second. Mr. Wright, <laughs> any discussion? Any more discussion? I ask for your vote, please. That is unanimous, Ms. Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to adjourn, Mr. Mayor. Second. second.